Hatun Tarhan. Saya mahasiswa berasal Turki yang sedang belajar di Universitas Riau. Saya senang berada di Universitas Riau karena Universitas Riau berada di lingkungan yang hijau. Universitas Riau adalah universitas negeri yang berdiri sejak 1 Oktober 1962. Para pendiri Universitas Riau disebut juga The Founding Fathers, diantaranya Kolonel Kaharudin Nasution, Suman HS, dan Dr. Andes Sultan Balia. Universitas Riau berada di jantung Provinsi Riau, yakni Kota Pekanbaru. Kota dengan semboyan bertua yang memegang teguh nilai adat dan budaya Melayu Riau. Masyarakatnya terkenal ramah dan terbuka. Kota Pekanbaru dijuluki Kota Bersih. Banyak fasilitas dan transportasi umum yang masih tertata dengan baik. Banyak pusat hiburan dan perbelanjaan yang menyediakan barang-barang berkualitas. Banyak makanan khas dari Pekanbaru, seperti lempuk durian, bolu kemojo, dan berbagai olahan ikan. Sebagai universitas yang terakreditasi B, Universitas Riau kini kian maju. Terutama sejak meraih peringkat ke-9 se-Indonesia berdasarkan UI Green Metric Ranking of World Universities atau peringkat 217 perguruan tinggi terbaik di dunia yang memiliki komitmen dalam tata kelola lingkungan hidup kampus. Hal ini ditandai dengan tingkat kehijauan kampus, penanaman pohon, dan adanya hutan arboretum yang memiliki beraneka ragam tumbuhan langka serta berbagai jenis satwa yang dilindungi. Tidak cukup sampai di situ, Prestasi juga diraih Universitas Riau dalam publikasi website Universitas, Jurnal Ilmiah Internasional, dan Penelitian. Universitas Riau menduduki peringkat kelima se-Indonesia versi penilaian Webometrics, dan peringkat ke-20 berdasarkan Ristek Dikti dari 3.320 pendidikan tinggi se-Indonesia, serta peringkat ke-19 berdasarkan lembaga pemeringkat dunia yang bernama Scopus. Hal ini sejalan dengan cita-cita Universitas Riau menjadi universitas riset yang world class university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dengan visi menjadi universitas riset yang cemerlang berbasiskan pengembangan sumber daya kawasan perairan dan budaya Melayu tahun 2035. Universitas Riau semakin berbenah. Universitas Riau memberikan pendidikan dan pengajaran yang bermutu untuk menghasilkan lulusan dan ilmu pengetahuan yang berguna baik skala nasional maupun internasional. Kami yakin Seluruh sivitas akademika akan memiliki banyak peluang untuk memajukan ilmu pengetahuan dan mengembangkan skill di sini, sehingga bisa berperan aktif dalam pembangunan negara kita tercinta. Terdapat sembilan fakultas yang ada di sini, seperti Fakultas Ilmu Sosial dan Ilmu Politik, Fakultas Keguruan dan Ilmu Pendidikan, Fakultas Perikanan dan Ilmu Kelautan, Fakultas Ekonomi Lalu juga ada Fakultas Teknik Fakultas Matematika dan Ilmu Pengetahuan Alam
Fakultas Pertanian. Fakultas Kedokteran. Dan Fakultas Hukum. Ada juga program studi ilmu keperawatan. Selain program sarjana, Universitas Riau juga menyediakan program magister dan program doktor. Dengan tenaga pengajar yang kompeten, dari internal Universitas Riau maupun hasil kerjasama luar negeri. Sedangkan dalam hal sarana belajar, Universitas Riau memiliki lima lokasi kampus, kampus UTI,
sebagai negara kepulauan terbesar, Indonesia memiliki wilayah laut dan perairan umum yang luas. Di dalamnya terkandung kekayaan sumber daya hayati yang melimpah. Sektor perikanan dan kelautan menjadi sektor strategis bagi Indonesia yang bila mana dikelola dengan inovatif, baik, dan berkelanjutan akan menjadi sumber modal pembangunan nasional dan dapat memberikan manfaat yang besar bagi negara dan kesejahteraan masyarakat Indonesia. Fakultas Perikanan dan Kelautan Universitas Riau yang merupakan Fakultas Perikanan dan Kelautan terunggul di Sumatera hadir berkontribusi mempersiapkan generasi perikanan dan kelautan yang tangguh untuk kesejahteraan masyarakat. Sejak berdiri pada tahun 1964, Fakultas Perikanan dan Kelautan Universitas Riau telah berbenah, berupaya, dan berkomitmen untuk mewujudkan pendidikan tinggi yang unggul di Indonesia dalam menghasilkan SDM dan IPTEK Perikanan dan Kelautan menjelang tahun 2035. Fakultas Perikanan dan Kelautan memiliki enam program studi serata satu, satu program studi magister, dan satu program doktoral yang saat ini juga beberapa program studi sedang mempersiapkan e, untuk dilakukan akreditasi internasional. Kegiatan akademik di Fakultas Perikanan dan Kelautan dimulai dari penerimaan mahasiswa baru sampai dengan pelaksanaan wisuda. Penerimaan mahasiswa baru di Fakultas Perikanan dan Kelautan meliputi tiga jalur, yaitu SNPTN dengan kuota 30%, SBMPTN dengan kuota 40%, dan jalur mandiri terdiri dari SNMPTN Barat dan PBUD dengan kuota 30%. Pelaksanaan akademik di Fakultas Perikanan dan Kelautan terdiri dari pelaksanaan perkuliahan, pelaksanaan praktikum, pelaksanaan magang, kukerta, dan pelaksanaan penelitian. Dalam pelaksanaan akademik tersebut, Fakultas Perikanan dan Kelautan menggunakan berbagai kurikulum, di antaranya yaitu kurikulum yang baru yaitu adalah kurikulum Merdeka Belajar Kampus Merdeka yang Fakultas Perikanan dan Kelautan telah terapkan dengan lebih kurang 10 sampai 15 SKS untuk masing-masing program studi. Di samping itu, untuk mendukung profil lulusan Mahasiswa Fakultas Perikanan Kelautan sesuai dengan kompetensi di bidang ilmunya, Fakultas Perikanan telah memiliki tempat uji kompetensi untuk menguji kompetensi keilmuan daripada mahasiswa tersebut. Sehingga diharapkan mahasiswa yang lulus betul-betul dapat memasuki dunia kerja sesuai dengan kompetensi di bidang keilmuannya. Untuk mendukung pembelajaran dan pelayanan kependidikan pada Fakultas Perikanan dan Kelautan Universitas Riau terdapat 38 tenaga kependidikan yang terdiri dari tenaga administrasi, pustakawan, peranata laboratorium pendidikan, dan teknisi. Kami terus berupaya dan berbenah meningkatkan mutu pembelajaran dengan melengkapi fasilitas pembelajaran seperti ruang kuliah, yang nyaman, laboratorium yang lengkap, sarana dan prasarana praktik yang representatif. Di samping itu juga, meningkatkan pelayanan pendidikan dengan membenahi sarana dan prasarana perkantoran, meningkatkan sarana pengembangan potensi seperti tempat berolahraga, tempat berdiskusi, dan tempat-tempat untuk bereksplorasi di lingkungan kampus. Mahasiswa di Fakultas Perikanan merupakan suatu aset terbesar yang kita miliki selain menimba ilmu di kelas, tentunya mereka perlu peningkatan kapasitas 
melalui kelembagaan dan keorganisasian yang ada di fakultas kita. Antara lain BEM, kemudian juga ada BLM, dan juga ada UKM, tiga UKM yang ada di Fakultas Perikanan. Tentunya wadah ini merupakan salah satu wadah untuk mengasah kemampuan mereka dalam berorganisasi. Dalam pengembangan Fakultas Perikanan, sudah dilakukan beberapa sinergitas kerjasama dengan pihak luar. Antara lain kerjasama dengan pemerintah daerah, pemerintah pusat, dan beberapa perusahaan swasta yang ada di Provinsi Riau. Dan juga kerjasama yang kita lakukan juga dengan pihak luar, lembaga riset yang berhubungan dengan Fakultas Perikanan dan Kelautan. Tentunya semua kerjasama ini merupakan suatu hal yang sangat baik untuk meningkatkan kemampuan lulusan kita nantinya dan mahasiswa untuk bisa magang dapat pekerjaan yang lebih baik di masa yang akan datang. Mahasiswa Fakultas Perikanan dan Kelautan Universitas Riau telah mengukir berbagai prestasi di bidang akademik dan non-akademik baik tingkat nasional maupun tingkat internasional. Pada tingkat nasional, sebagai juara satu penulisan esse di Provinsi Riau, sedangkan pada tingkat internasional sebagai the best idea pada acara Asia Yacht Cultural Expos Thailand tahun 2019 dan juga di bidang olahraga atlet anggar ASEAN yang sudah mengikuti berbagai pertandingan di Malaysia, Singapura dan Thailand Sampai tahun 2020 alumni kita tersebar di seluruh Indonesia kemudian di bagai berbagai mancanegara alumni yang tersebar ini merupakan suatu kekuatan yang selalu bermitra dan memberikan suatu dukungan kepada Fakultas Perikanan untuk dalam kemajuan memberikan informasi dan memberikan segala bantuan baik itu fisik maupun material maupun moral untuk pengembangan Fakultas Perikanan dan Kelautan yang kita cintai Kami tenaga pendidik dan kependidikan bersama-sama bertekad dan menduguhkan niat untuk bahu-membahu dalam mewujudkan visi dan misi fakultas sehingga mampu berkontribusi secara maksimal di dalam proses pendidikan dan pencerdasan seluruh anak bangsa dalam bidang perikanan dan kelautan. Sekali layar terkembang, pantang surut ke belakang. Langsung. 
Your Highness Rector of yeah. Tes satu dua tiga. Tes satu dua tiga. Oke. Your Highness Rector of Universitas Riau, Profesor Dr. Insinyur Aras Mulyadi DEA, Dean of Fisheries and Marine Science Faculty of Universitas Riau, Profesor Dr. Insinyur Bintal Amin MSc, Coordinator of Organizing Committee, Dr. Trisla Warningsi SPI MSi. Valuable presenters, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sudah terbang si burung puyuh, terbang ke tepian, mencari makan. Selamat datang ke ISFM ke-10, hasil penelitian disebarluaskan. It means we are welcoming you in the 10th ISFM to share the new findings of our research. Let us introduce ourselves. I am Triatma Putri. And I am Ashraf Oktaviari. It's just an honor for us to be the master of ceremony in this event. We welcome, welcome you to the 10th International, International and National, National Seminar of Fisheries and, and Marine Science. Science. First of all, we would like to extend a warm welcome to all of the honorable guests presenters, and participants to the 10 International and National Seminar of Fisheries and Marine Science. In fact, we have with us today delegates from various institutions, from national and international. It is indeed an honor for us, Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science, Universitas Riau, to be able to host such an important seminar today. Now, let us sing the national anthem. To all of the audience, please stand up. We invite Dr. Morina Riawanti Siregar, Deep Biol MP, to lead the song. To Dr. Morina, the floor is yours. Before we start our seminar, let us pray to God first. We warmly invite Mr. Inda Lesmana, SPE, MSE, to lead the prayer. To Mr. Lesmana, the prayer is yours. Thank you. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Hadirin yang berbahagia Ladies and gentlemen Let us bow our head for a moment Mari sejenak kita menundukkan hati dan kepala Pray to God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So that our international and national seminar Can be precious to all of you Seraya berdoa kepada Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Agar seminar internasional dan nasional ini dapat menjadi momen berharga bagi kita semua. I will lead this pray based on the teaching of Islam and those who are not Muslim, you are pleased to pray according to each of your beliefs. Uh, izinkan saya memimpin doa berdasarkan tata cara Islam dan bagi yang non Muslim silakan berdoa sesuai dengan keyakinannya masing-masing. Alhamdulillah minas syaitonir rajim bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Hamdan yuafi ni'amahu wa yukafi mazidah Ya Rabbana laka alhamdu kama yanbari li jalali wa jika azimi sultani Allahumma inna nas'aluka salamatan fi al-deen wa afiyatan fi al-jasad wa ziyadatan fi al-ilmi wa barakatan fi al-rizq wa tawbatan qabla al-maut wa rahmatan inda al-maut wa maghfiratan ba'da al-maut اللهم اغفر لنا ولوالدينا وللمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سامع قريب مجيب الدعوة يا قاضي الحاجات يا الله يا رحمن today Wednesday September 15 2021 in this beautiful place we gather here to bring about an tenth international and national seminar of fisheries and marine science the themes of the opportunity and future challenges in fisheries, marine and environmental science in new normal era. <coughs> Pada hari ini, Rabu 15 September 2021, di tempat yang indah ini, kita berkumpul untuk mengadakan seminar internasional dan nasional perikanan dan kelautan ke yang ke-10 dengan tema peluang dan tantangan ke depan bidang perikanan kelautan dan ilmu lingkungan di era new normal. <coughs> Ya Allah Ya Rahim, make this seminar as a useful science assembly, as a medium of sharing useful ideas, knowledge and experiences of scholars, researchers and students of various disciplines. May the seminar we organize today benefit to our lives, broaden our knowledge, sign our ideas and lead use to be a successful, productive person which in turn will boost uh, dignity for of our nation. <coughs> Jadikan seminar ini sebagai tempat pertemuan ilmu pengetahuan yang bermanfaat ya Allah sebagai media untuk berbagi ide, pengetahuan dan pengalaman yang bermanfaat dari para cendikiawan, peneliti dan mahasiswa dari berbagai disiplin ilmu. Semoga seminar yang kami selenggarakan ini bermanfaat bagi kehidupan kami, memperluas pengetahuan kami, mencemerlangkan gagasan kami dan memimpin Memimpin kami untuk menjadi orang-orang produktif yang sukses yang pada gilirannya akan meningkatkan martabat bangsa kami. Ya Allah, guide and bless our head and our minds with the light of your guidance. Impart your supreme wisdom upon our activities. Help us to speak our means clearly. Clearly help you to listen to each other, respect each other, love each other, so that we are included to be blessed persons. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, tuntun dan berkatilah hati dan pikiran kami dengan cahaya bimbinganmu. Terapkanlah kebijakanmu pada kegiatan kami. Bantu kami untuk dapat berbicara dengan jelas dan fasih. Bantu kami untuk saling mendengarkan, saling menghormati, saling mencintai, sehingga kami termasuk orang-orang yang diberkahi. Ya Allah, Ya Tuhan kami, protect us from unintended temptation. So use the right paths and give us knowledge and strength to perform good things accordingly. So use and make it clear the bad thing and give us knowledge and strength to avoid them. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, lindungi kami dari hal-hal yang tidak diinginkan. Tunjukkanlah kami bahwa yang benar itu benar dan yang salah itu salah. Beri kami pengetahuan dan kekuatan untuk melakukan hal-hal yang baik dan menghindari hal-hal yang buruk. Ya Allah, you are the one who can fulfill our doa. Rabbana atina fid dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina azaban nar subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun alal mursalin wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Thank you, Mr. Lesman. We invite the Rector of Universitas Riau, Professor Aras Mulyadi DA, to deliver the speech. Through Professor Aras Mulyadi, the floor is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Penulisan serial selalu berupaya untuk memberikan ruang bagi pengembangan penelitian dan pengabdian masyarakat kepada dosen dan peneliti. Salah satu upaya tersebut adalah melaksanakan konferensi ilmiah tempat dosen dan peneliti berbagi hasil penelitian dari berbagai bidang ilmu. ISFM adalah salah satu konferensi ilmiah tingkat internasional pada bidang perikanan dan kelautan yang telah dilaksanakan selama 10 tahun terakhir. Tahun ini merupakan tahun kedua konferensi ini dilaksanakan secara virtual. Berbagai penelitian terbaru di bidang perikanan dan kelautan dipaparkan oleh berbagai peneliti dan dosen dari dalam negeri maupun luar negeri. Kami mengundang para dosen dan peneliti di bidang perikanan dan kelautan untuk ikut serta dalam konferensi ilmiah di ISFM ke-10 tahun 2021. Pandemi yang masih melanda dunia seharusnya tidak menyurutkan kontribusi para peneliti dan dosen dalam pengembangan penelitian yang bermanfaat bagi masyarakat luas. Akhir kata, saya Profesor Dr. Aras Mulyadi, Rektor Universitas Rio, mengucapkan selamat dan sukses atas pelaksanaan ISFM ke-10 tahun 2021. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Aras Mulyadi. Now, we invite the Dean of Fisheries and Marine Science Faculty, Professor Bintal Amin MSc, to deliver a speech and open our seminar. To Professor Bintal Amin MSc, the floor is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. First of all, I would like to thank Honorable Rector of Universitas Riau, Professor Aras Mulyadi, and Chairman of the Institute of for Research and Community Services Universitas Riau, Professor Almas Disahza, for being with us today, and also for the support to this seminar activity. On behalf of Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science, Universitas Riau. It is such a great pleasure for me to welcome all honorable international keynote speakers. We have uh, Professor Emmanuel Cruz, Associate Professor Janice Ragaza from the Philippines, Professor Liu Kuang Ming from Taiwan, Professor Rizal Rasman, and Professor Natra Fatin from Malaysia, Professor Sutawat Benjakul from Thailand, and Associate Professor Indra Swarman from Indonesia. We would also like to welcome all other presenters for joining us today and tomorrow to share recent knowledge and expertise on fisheries and marine science in this scientific event of the 10th International and National Seminars on Fisheries and Marine Science 2021. This ISFM webinar is organized by our faculty of uh, fisheries and marine science uh, 
Universitas Riau and has been conducted uh, every year since the last 10 years. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which is still around us today, just like last year, we have decided to conduct the event through webinar system. I have been informed by the organizing committee that this year we will have more than 100 selected papers to be presented later on in a parallel session. We do realize that fisheries, both freshwater and marine, are remain important resources for food, nutrition, income, and livelihood for hundreds of millions of people around the world. Fish also continues to be one of the most traded food commodities worldwide. Recent report by high-level experts and international organization representatives all highlighted the tremendous potential of the oceans and inland waters, and even more so the future to contribute significantly to food security and adequate nutrition for a global population expected to reach 9.7 billion by 2050. Marine and inland fishery sectors has been recognized as a powerful income and employment generator as it stimulates growth of subsidiary industries. At the same time, it is an important livelihood for income generators of more than 1 billion world fishermen and fish farmers, mainly in developing countries, including here in Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia has a national goals on marine and fisheries as to manage, to conserve, and develop sustainable fisheries resources, to contribute and ensuring people's food security and to socio-economic development in order to enhance people's livelihood and the nation's prosperity. Universitas Riau, through the Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science, has a moral responsibility to support the government's program. Learning outcomes and technology produced by university should be relevant to skill and technology needed by fisheries and marine industries. Indonesia has a huge potential resources from the marine sectors, having 6.4 million kilometers square of marine area with 108,000 kilometers coastline and more than 17,000 uh, islands. Indonesia has a vast economic sectors to be developed, such as fisheries, mariculture, mangrove, coral reef, mining, transportation and biotechnology, also tourism and other non-conventional resources. But on the other hand, at the same time, we also have, a take, we have to take a precaution on the threat to our marine environments such as uh, degradation of marine resources and pollution. Hopefully, through the seminar, we would be able to gather some valuable information to be used for the development of our fisheries and marine sectors. Finally, I would like to extend our sincere thanks to the organizing committee that has been endeavored to succeed this webinar event. I hope that this webinar will give benefit to all of us and we could see each other again in a similar event in the, in the years to come. By saying, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I officially open the 10th International and National Seminar on Fisheries and Marine Science 2021. May Allah give us bless and great success. Wa bil taufiq wa hidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Lanjutkan dengan itu. All of the presenters? We invite okay to come to in front of the stage. Okay, so all of the audience may sit back down. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Bintal Ami. Distinguished presenters, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Our program today, we invite Mr. Joko Samiaji, PhD, as a moderator to lead this session, and to all our honorable keynote speaker, Professor Emmanuel M. V. Kress, Professor Liu Kuang Ming, Dr. M. Riza Rahman, Professor Dr. Suttawat Benjakul, Associate Professor Dr. Natra Isan, Associate Professor Jenis Aragaza, and Dr. Indra Suharman, MSc. To Mr. Samiaji and keynote speakers, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Putri and Apan. Ya. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good morning to all of us, distinguished keynote speakers, and my beloved colleagues, participants in this IASM that is held by the Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science, Universitas Rio. It is my pleasure to be a moderator in this event. And let me introduce myself. I am a lecturer at the Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science since 1989. And I had my PhD from Southampton University in UK. Yeah. So today, it is a magic number of seven. Yeah because we have uh, seven keynote speakers. Seven is really a special number. As a marine scientist, we have seven oceans also in the world. Yeah? And then we have seven sky layers. So seven is a really magic numbers. So once again, welcome to all of you. And we would like to extend our cordial thanks to keynote speakers and also to the participants. I noticed that we have around 120 titles from the international seminars and these papers coming from 25 institutions. So once again, many, many thanks. Before I start the session, uh, I would like to especially well, warm welcome to Professor Hari Eko Irianto and Ibu Dr. Fusna Sumbudi, who are among our audience. Those two are my uh, colleagues when we had collaboration with uh, Germany. Yeah? Uh, so really uh, pleased to have both of you, Pa Eko, pa Ari Eko and Ibu Husna. Yeah? And also, of course, my colleagues from all over Indonesia, from Aceh to uh, Maluku. Yeah? Uh, we have the participants from uh, 24 provinces from Indonesia. This is really something. Yeah? All right. Uh, I would like to explain about the rule of this session. As we have met on Saturday last week, every presenter will be given time allocation for 15 minutes. Before the time ends, two minutes before the time ends, I would give the notification. Yeah. So please manage well about your time. And hopefully, seven topics will give us an important lesson for today's seminar. Once again, many, many thanks. And for the first, I would like to give the opportunity. Would you please welcome Professor Emmanuel Manalat Veracruz. He based in Central Luzon State University. Yeah? And the title of his presentation today is about social status regulates growth rate and hepatitic insulin-like growth factor, hygiene expression on oreochromis niloticus, even under limited period of physical interaction. So, Professor Emmanuel, the time is yours. Good morning to all of us. I will present a study entitled Social Status Regulates Growth Rate and Hepatic Insulin-like Growth Factor 1, Gene Expression in Nile Tilapia or Chromis niloticus L, even under limited period of physical interaction. 
Somatic growth in fishes is regulated by a variety of factors, which includes nutrition and environmental conditions. These factors in turn control the synthesis and release of hormones, which regulate growth through endocrine, paracrine, and or autocrine modes. In aquaculture, heterogeneous growth of fish is very common, and this is due to social interactions and formation of feeding hierarchies which results to changes in metabolism of subordinate and dominant fish. Central to the hormonal control of growth is the growth hormone insulin-like uh, insulin growth factor system in fish. The growth-promoting actions of the growth hormone is mediated through induction of the insulin-like growth factor 1. Environmental cues received by the brain will induce the synthesis of growth hormones in the pituitary gland. Upon release in the blood of the growth hormone, it will stimulate the production of IGF-1 in the liver. And when this hormone is released in the blood, most of them are binded to IGF binding proteins. And when they are released by these binding proteins and they are free IGF-1s, they interact to the IGF receptors located in the target tissues. It is in this mechanism that mediates uh, the majority of the IGF-1 uh, actions. Previous study conducted by Vera Cruz and Brown in 2007 has shown that social rank influence growth and IGF-1 gene expression in fish. However, in their study, fish pair were reared in small aquarium where subordinate had limited space to stay away from the dominant fish. This study therefore evaluated the influence of social rank under limited period of physical interaction on the growth and IGF-1 gene expression in Orochromis niloticus. To assess the objective, 20 all-male juveniles of Nile tilapia of similar size with no apparent difference in social history were isolated in 30 by 15 by 30 centimeter grass aquaria for 10 days. After, these, after establishing the competing pair in, for social interaction, its individual in a pair was marked by small cut on the upper or lower part of the tail. After marking them, both uh, the fish in a pair were introduced in the same size new aquarium at the same time to prevent the possible effect of place familiarity. After social interaction was settled, dominant and subordinate individuals are drilled separately in one aquarium divided by glass so that they can still view one another. The divider was removed 10 minutes daily. Uh, for social interaction. Its fish in a pair was uh, fed at the same rate daily to remove the effect of nutrition. Weight was monitored on day two, day seven, and day 14 during the interaction period. Then the hepatic IGF-1 gene expression was uh, quantified in its fish. The Hepatic RNA was purified using trisol following the manufacturer's protocol. Then the total RNA was quantified using the spectrophotometer. The first strand cDNA was synthesized by reverse transcription. Then it was uh, multiplied through cloning by PCR. The IGF-1 was quantified using Tachman QRT-PCR assay on RT-PCR machine using standard cycling conditions. The forward primer, reverse primer, and probe use was based on the sequence of IGF-1 cDNA by Veracruz et al. in 2006. The reporter that used was FAM and the quencher that was Tamra. Standard carb was generated from serial dilution of a complementary DNA ranging in concentration of 0.01 to 100 nanogram per 
microliter. The amount of IGF mRNA in its experimental sample was determined by comparison with the generated standard curve. Percentage data were arc sign transformed prior to statistical analysis. E-test was used to compare mean specific growth rate and mean IGF gene expression between the two social groups. Linear regression and Pearson correlation coefficient was computed to determine the possible linear relationship between growth and absolute abundance of IGF mRNA. This table shows the mean body weight of competing fish before and during the interaction period. There was no significant difference between the two social groups during the start of the experiment, but on day two, day seven, and day 14, there was a significantly higher mean body weight in dominant fish as compared to subordinate fish. The weight loss of subordinate fish a day after social interaction is not a reflection of the mobilization of stored metabolic reserves for physical activity associated with social stress, but it is more a result of inhibited food intake and emptiness of the stomach of subordinate. Now on the evaluation of mean specific growth rate from day seven to day 14, there was a significantly higher mean specific growth rate in dominant individual than in subordinate one. The mean specific growth rate for dominant obtained in this study was 1.61% per day, which was slightly higher than the one obtained by Veracruz and Brown in 2007 of 1.48%. However, in the case of subordinate uh, fish, the obtained mean specific growth rate was 0.93%, which is 0.5% higher compared to the 0.43% obtained by Veracruz and Brown in 2007. The greater difference between the specific growth rates of subordinate fish in the two studies compared to the difference between Specific growth rates of the dominant fish may be due to the lesser physical interaction used in this study of only 10 minutes per day or a longer duration of the social interaction. In this case, we utilize 14 days in this study compared to 10 days in the previous study, giving more time for the subordinate fish to adjust and adapt to the social condition. However, the body weight differences between dominant and subordinate fish may be due to behavioral differences, particularly the reduced appetite or inhibited food intake in subordinates, which may be due to increased serotonin in the brain and or increased uh, neuropeptide Y mRNA in preoptic area or the release of corticotropin releasing factor in subordinates. It may also be due to changes in metabolism, particularly the bile retention in the gallbladder in subordinates, which indicates that uh, not effectively converting fatty acid uh, or fatty food into body weight and or higher hepatic pyruvate kinase activity in dominance, which indicates the use of ingested food for energy and or higher hepatic phospho and all pyruvate carboxykinase activity in subordinate, which indicates the reliance to stored metabolic uh, reserve. The metabolic changes and physiological stress in subordinate fish may be due to the, uh, despite the limited period of physical contact of 10 minutes per day only, may be due to visual interaction or communication between the dominant and subordinate fish, in which the subordinate may have received signals from the dominant or so the dominant through the glass divider. The importance of the results of this study in aquaculture is that in a population composed of competing fish, this will result to formation of hierarchy 
and having the dominant intermediate and subordinate uh, fish in the population. So during the harvest period, the largest uh, fish in the population are the dominants followed by intermediate and the smallest are the subordinate. Now on hepatic IGF mRNA expression, there was a significantly higher uh, gene expression in dominance as compared to dominant fish. With regards to the relationship between IGF-1 mRNA and specific growth rate, there was a significant positive correlation between the two parameters. This supports the results of the study of Veracruz et al. 2006, Veracruz and Brown 2007, 2009, 2011, and Kiang 2012 that hepatic IGF-1 mRNA levels can be used as instantaneous growth rate indicator in Nantilapia. Now, from the results of the study, the following conclusion can be derived. Even under reduced period of physical contact, but with chances of visual communication, social rank regulates growth and IGF mRNA expression in orochromis melotica. Second, behavioral changes such as reduced appetite in subordinate fish resulted to a reduced growth rate. And third, social dominancy instantaneously modulated hepatic mRNA levels while social and physiological stresses depress them. I would like to thank the Philippine Commission on Higher Education for funding this project and also the Universitas Riau for inviting me to be a speaker in this uh, research conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Emmanuel. It's really interesting topic that you present for us. Yeah, I think it is also related with the trend in Indonesia and all over Southeast Asia in uh, general. Yeah, because uh, tilapia or oreochromus is an important diet in our society. I think similar in the Philippines, in Vietnam, Thailand, yeah? And for those who will uh, take a postgraduate program, I think Professor Emmanuel is really welcome, yeah? In guiding yes. the master or PhD students in the future. Anyway, Professor yeah. Emmanuel finished his PhD from Florida International University in Miami, uh, in the year of 2006. And he has a very, very extensive works from his CP. He really a very, very industrious uh, scientist. Yeah? So Thank please, uh, if uh, the audience, particularly from the youngsters, will pursue the master or PhD program, please contact him. I think he would be very glad to help. Many thanks, Professor. Emmanuel, Thank you very again. much. Okay, we move to the second presenter. I would like to invite cordially Professor Huang Ming Liu yeah, from Taiwan. Yeah, and the title for his presentation today is on conservation. So this seminar is really something special because we cover the broad perspective of fisheries and marine science. And from Taiwan, we will learn about the shark fisheries as well as management and conservation. So, Professor Huang Ming Liu, the time is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, uh, uh, my name is Guang Ming Liu from uh, National Taiwan Ocean University. And uh, uh, before I my talk, I'd like to thank the uh, uh, ISM. ISM uh, FM organizing organizing committee for inviting me to attend this seminar. My topic today is uh, shark fishery management and conservation of shark in Taiwan. Okay, so as uh, all of you know, sharks have existed on the earth for more than uh, 400 million years, and sharks have, sharks have uh, general uh, characteristics of uh, uh, the following characteristics, uh, which is uh, quite different from terrier uh, uh, fishes. 
they are case selection species. They produce very few uh, offspring, uh, mature late, and grow slowly. So uh, they are vulnerable to overfishing. So sharks uh, mostly are bycatch. So bycatch means uh, accidental catch plus discard. Uh, some of the small sharks will discard. So because they are uh, low economic value comparing with uh, some other high value species such as tuna, so uh, shark fisheries management uh, uh, were hidden by lacking of catch, discard, and effort data. So these uh, predator and affects the uh, balance of marine ecosystem. So here I give you an example. This example is from the US East Coast. So on the top is the large shark. So large sharks uh, decreasing from the, uh, the 70s until the uh, 2000, uh, year 2005. And then their prey, the small sharks and scale and ray increase because the predator decreased. And again, uh, the small sharks increase, their prey will decrease. So, which means the large sharks uh, will influence the whole ecosystem. So it's, it's not just the, uh, one species, but it's an ecosystem uh, perspective. So in the earlier this year, uh, January 8, uh, 28th, uh, there's a, a paper uh, published in Nature uh, fortunately, I'm one of the co-authors, many co-authors. Uh, the, the title is Half a Half Century of Global Decline in Ocean uh, Sharks and Rays. So during this, uh, in these papers, 71% uh, of the 18 uh, species, they are declining uh, in the past 50 years. Uh, so it's very uh, significant decline of the uh, shark uh, resources, particularly the project sharks, uh, which are uh, bycatch by a uh, uh, long line. So if you look at uh, by ocean, uh, Atlantic Ocean, uh, Indian Ocean, and Pacific Ocean, all of the three oceans are declined on the uh, shark resources. Uh, if you divide, uh, look at by species, you can look at uh, some of them uh, declined on t uh, to 20, 28 uh, percent less than uh, 50 years ago. Okay, especially for the uh, scales, uh, scale and race, they decreased uh, to uh, even less than one percent of uh, uh, 20 years ago. Okay, so the scientists also put many shark species as, uh, for instance, uh, so sharks, uh, so fishes as uh, appendix two, appendix one, and also appendix two for those uh, sharks, okay? So, which means shark conservation and uh, management has been uh, uh, concerned by the environmental group and also the uh, global uh, society. So, uh, talking about the shark catch in Taiwan, uh, annual catch of, uh, the annual catch of Taiwan is around uh, 40,000 tons which is number four in the world next to Indonesia. Indonesia is the number one uh, shark catch countries and followed by India and Spain. So 85% 80, 80, uh, of shark catch from Taiwan is from the uh, far sea fisheries, uh, mainly the bycatch and the remaining are from the coastal and uh, offshore fisheries. So uh, here is the coastal and shark, uh, offshore shark fisheries uh, we have uh, these uh, large sharks, uh, whale shark, and we have a uh, uh, mega mouth shark, uh, which is uh, only right now is only about 250 individuals uh, caught, uh, recorded in the world. Okay, scatter ham head. Scatter ham head, big eye stretcher shark, and also other sharks, uh, the coastal uh, fisheries. Talking about far sea fisheries, uh, here is the uh, map showing uh, Taiwanese longline fisheries in the Pacific Ocean. For the uh, blue one, are uh, the sharks uh, basically uh, caught in the high latitude. The yellow one was uh, dolphin fish, mahi mahi, and the, uh, the pink one are tunas, and 
these one, uh, orange one, are uh, billfish. Okay, so among the shark uh, catch, blue shark are about 81%. Uh, so it's a number one catch uh, of sharks. So how about the uh, shark management uh, in Taiwan? Shark management working group uh, uh, initiated in 2001, uh, including uh, fishermen, uh, government officials, and scholars. So at that time, the, the aim of that uh, working group was discuss shark management and management of the whale shark, okay? So for the whale shark management, we started a, a catch and report scheme in 2001, and then to next year, 2002, we have a, a total allowable catch uh, from 80 uh, uh, decrease to uh, 65 and 60 and completely uh, a banded in 2008. So it's uh, management, uh, adaptive uh, management, uh, the TAC is reduced year by year, not standardly banded. So with this uh, policy, we also have the poster to the, uh, and education to the uh, fishermen. So the fishermen sh uh, should uh, report their catch and follow the uh, TAC. So in 2008, we banned uh, retention of uh, all the uh, uh, whale sharks. Okay, so uh, regarding the National Plan of Action Sharks, uh, we follow the FAO. They announced the uh, International Plan of Action of Sharks in, 2000, uh, uh, in 1999. So we did uh, announce our National Plan of Action of Sharks in 2008. The first one version uh, in two, earlier 2000, and then second one is 2012. Okay. So uh, in addition to this uh, management, we also have some education uh, outreach, uh, distribute uh, shark hand, uh, handbook to fishermen, and hosting international shark conferences uh, in 2002 and 2005. And also we talk about the shark conservation and management during the uh, APEC uh, roundtable, OFWG roundtable meeting in 2013. And also we uh, promoting public awareness of uh, sustainable ut utilization of sharks. So these are the uh, photos of the two uh, meetings. And this is APEC uh, meeting, roundtable meeting we are talking about shark conservation and management. And also we have a recommendation to the uh, OFWG, APEC OFWG, okay? And in addition to that, we also attend uh, many uh, international shark management meetings. Uh, for instance, uh, South Asia uh, Shark Fin Identification Workshop, uh, ICAT uh, Shark Working Group meeting. And also we are hosting uh, 2018 uh, shark fin identification uh, uh, workshop with the NGOs. So NGOs uh, promoting how to identify uh, shark fin. Okay, so shark management measure for uh, RFMO uh, by different oceans, also they have uh, some different uh, management. Uh, for instance, band retention in Pacific Ocean is uh, oceanic white tip and Silky shark and shark management measure in Taiwan. We have uh, 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 the following uh, actions: uh, fin attached landing policy, so we preventing the uh, finning activities. No retention of uh, whale shark, manta rays, and uh, oceanic white tip silky and treasure sharks, uh, etc. So. Uh, for the uh, large sharks, uh, whale shark, basking shark, gray shark, uh, mega, mega mouse, we have to re, uh, report the report scheme. And also we have a note of shark fin import. Uh, these are uh, catch report species, the large sharks. And finally, we have the uh, uh, monitoring and law enforcement uh, actions uh, with cooperate with global uh, fishing watching which is a Google uh, system. And also we have uh, our own vessel uh, monitoring uh, center to monitoring uh, this uh, shark, uh, this uh, fishing 
vessel activity in the fasces. And also we have an e-double uh, system, okay? And finally, uh, NTOU, my university, National Taiwan Ocean University, have seven uh, colleges and all, delayed, uh, all related to the ocean and focused uh, education and research. So we expect to cooperate with Asian universities on marine and fisheries related research. And also we welcome the uh, students uh, to, uh, to come to our university to uh, study a uh, master or PhD student, uh, PhD programs. So that's my talk for today. Uh, thank you. Thank you indeed, <laughs> Professor Kuang Ming Liu. It is very interesting topic also because in Indonesia, <clears throat> especially, we do not have a very many research on sharks. Yeah. So it is very important for us, the audience, to learn about this approach that is proposed by Professor Huang Ming Liu. He has presented on how to manage, and also he has also suggested how to deal with the education and outreach program so the conservation of SAC will be successful. And he also offering that if you have the interest in pursuing master or PhD degree in Taiwan and, and especially for SAC conservation, so please contact him. Yeah, Taiwan government is really keen actually on the students. That's what I know until now, yeah. And Professor Prof. Kuang Ming Liu is graduated from University of Michigan in the United States. So both the first presenters this morning are the American alumni. Yeah? And he has extensive works also in fish biology, fish population dynamics, and of course, stock assessment. So it is very important for Indonesia. It is important for Southeast Asia and, and the world that the conservation of fish in the sea must be considered as the first priority. Yeah? And also in Indonesia, we have so many species of shark under the status of uh, threats or extension. So it is very important topic we choose through the seminar and hopefully it will be uh, valuable information for all of us. Thank you very much, Professor Kuang Ming Lu. Berikutnya, okay. karena dia dari Indonesia, so let me use bahasa Indonesia. Berikutnya, kami persilakan Bapak Profesor Dr. Muhammad Rijal dari UKM in Malaysia. Yeah. Uh, he is an expert in environment law and management. And this is very uh, thankful yeah, that we have uh, Pak Muhammad Rijal. Yeah. And the topic for his presentation is about the waste management during the pandemic COVID-19. The management based on the institutional arrangement toward marine environmental sustainability. Again, this is another uh, thriving topic and this is the daily life that we face, not only in Indonesia, but also elsewhere. Yeah, so Professor Muhammad Rija, dipersilahkan dengan hormat Bapak. Please. Terima kasih. Thank you very much to uh, Dr. Moderator. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee uh, for inviting me today. Uh, for today, I will discuss uh, on regards of, uh, under the title of Governance of Waste Management during uh, pandemic COVID-19 event based on institutional arrangement to its marine environmental sustainability. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, for information, COVID-19 has been categorized as category B uh, under international dangerous goods regulations, uh, being considered as infectious substances, whereby being regulated as hazardous material, have the capacity of posing reasonable risk to health, safety, and property. Therefore, uh, required uh, strict requirements on this matter. 
in response to the COVID-19, hospital, healthcare facilities, quality sites, and individuals are producing more waste than usual, including face masks, gloves, gowns, and other personal protective equipment, PPE, that could if have been affected with the COVID-19. This is also a large increase in the amount of single-use plastic produced. And COVID-19 has affected uh, plastic production eventually become a waste problem to the marine environment. When not managed properly during COVID-19, this waste can reach to the marine environment. So COVID-19 has affected plastic production, waste management, and recycle sectors. Therefore, require a stringent measures on handling, collection, separation, packaging, storage, transportation, treatment, as well as disposal sophistications. So, Government of Waste Management, especially on COVID-19 event, it need to have a look, uh, use the instrument of institutional arrangement to ensure the marine environmental sustainability. So what is institutional arrangement? Institutional arrangement basically is a system of established and prevalent social rules that structure social interactions. It can be a formal and also informal elements, having a legal and non-legal instrument. For what purpose? To mobilize interaction between three main domains of institutions. So basically, instrument as a system to mobilize interaction between three domains of institution. What are those domains? Basically, there are three domains which I've told you in the previous slide. Uh, uh, it encompasses of society, government, as well as industry. And under society, having a subdomain of their own, named as family and community. As for family unit, a subdomain of society, a few uh, family unit been set up, it can be create a community unit subdomain of society. As for government, having a several sub-level domain of government, starting from the, uh, the lowest level, meaning that from the grassroots level, known as local government, or some nation called municipal government, intermediate uh, government, level government, known as state government of provincial government, or some nation called divisional government, and the highest level of government is known as federal, or central or national, based on the constitution of that particular nation to uh, give a term is whether it's federal, central, or national government. On the other hand, the domain of industry having several subdomains known as uh, a multinational corporation or government corporation or small medium enterprises. So basically, all these domains are interacted to each other based on the system of institutional arrangement. And not only that, it been interacted subdomain of other subdomain can be interacted with other subdomain in other domain. And it is very dynamic and eventually it becomes complex because of these interactions. And because of the a dynamic interaction and because the complex of interaction from subdomain to other subdomain in other domain, uh, many literatures has proposed four institutional approaches in order to make sure the interaction become uh, colorful and fruitful among uh, the domain and subdomain of the institution. What are those? They are a power approach, interest approach, knowledge approach, as well as foreign approach. Basically, there are four approaches. So keep have a look. The first approach is known as whereby national, provincial, or municipal government existing waste management and legislation will benefit greatly uh, uh, 
uh, from the plans legislation in the response to the COVID-19 risk. For municipality of countries do not have the existing strategies or plan or legislation, they are developed. They should include contingency plan in pandemic situation. In this context, can inform ongoing COVID-19 risk management challenges. An additional regulation uh, guidelines are needed for the waste generated during COVID-19, especially due to increasing of the nation or the potential contributed uh, waste, such as face masks, tissues, disposal clothes that become waste problem to the marine environment. As for the second approach, uh, based on the cost and benefit uh, concept, as included a three uh, factor in a three dimension known as social, economics as also environmental dimension. As for economics dimension, lack of uh, proper waste management practices due to technical operation and financial constraints are particularly vulnerable during the pandemic COVID-19 with its risks and challenges. Due to the low investment in core infrastructure, eventually lack of modern technology to treat mixed contaminated waste during COVID-19. So COVID-19 should be a warning. More basic infrastructure is needed it should be uh, uh, in line with the requirement relevant uh, MBAs urgently needed, such as uh, Basel Convention, Rotterdam Convention, and Stockholm Convention. As for social dimension, the important is that two main components on the uh, social dimension is about level of awareness through communication. These two are interrelated in social dimension. So awareness rising of communication for health staff and public is required during COVID-19. And public communication to develop additional guidelines on risk many generation of quality, uh, or the treatment and diagnosis quality of COVID-19 patient is very crucial. And on top of that, the de development of media, uh, such as website and others, for hygiene practice and safety handling of waste management during COVID-19. As for environmental dimension, sustainability assessment of technologies, methodology will help the decision makers to choose be best available technology for source of generation primary disposal, especially on the COVID-19. This way, best environmental practice can use as shared at the national level during COVID-19. And it will ensure to achieve sustainable development uh, for the SDGs. So these are SDGs, sustainable development goals, based on the concept of uh, sustainable development having 17 goals. Okay, the third approach is known as knowledge approach. It based on concept of sustainable development. Introduced by the Barnard Report in 1987, in studying sustainable development, the, the tool of sustainability science will come to the picture. And a uh, sustainable development is the catalyst for encouraging for sustainable development. And for this concept has been embedded in many conferences such as United Nations Conferences Environment and Development in 1992, also known as Rio Summit, whereby there are two essential instruments on the conferences known as S Charter and Agenda 21, embedded the sustainable development uh, concept. Not only that, uh, United Nations has uh, promoted uh, through a million development goals uh, within 15 years, introduced eight goals and many of the United Nations members have participated. And after the million development goals that embedded the sustainable development has completed, the United Nations has introduced on sustainable development goals, which I've shared with you the slide before, uh, introduced starting 2015 until 2030 on 17 goals and have been participated by uh, all members of the United Nations. As COVID is concerned, in absence of appropriate technology during COVID-19, consider adopting of the 3S methodology, installation of temporary stop-gap solution, a small and relative sound manner towards sustainable development in order to achieve sustainable development goal, SDG. And 3S methodology here, which includes sorting, segregation, and storage. Uh, so meaning that, uh, or regards of COVID waste, it should be uh, separated at the point of generation. And why is important? Because 
in a way, it, it, it will be environmental friendly towards the sustainable development to achieve sustainable development goals. So in this manner, uh, the lo locally manufactured insulator packed with three S, which I mentioned just now, may consider the need to treat the COVID-19 waste and prevent onward transmission. And uh, the solution mentioned uh, to ensure the marine environmental sustainability during COVID event, as well as to achieve uh, focusing on the three SDGs, uh, SDG 3, 6, and 14, which uh, three on regards of good, half and will be uh, six on clean uh, water and sanitation, and finally 14 on life below water. Finally, the uh, final approach is the forum approach, whereby uh, it based on the root of interaction and dynamics, dynamics interaction between the three main domain of the institution, namely which we have discussed earlier, on society, government, industry. So for COVID is concerned, whereby, as we know, COVID will increase consumption of personal care, uh, single use product, and countries require more robust system on waste segregation. And we need to know, uh, need to have a guidelines for safety disposal. In order to do that, it's clearly, it's required a joint effort between these three main domain of the institution, society, government, as well as industry. And finally, uh, lastly, institutional arrangement through these three main domain, society, government, industry, by using these approaches, able to uh, mold the government of waste management, especially at, uh, during COVID-19, uh, by uh, to ensure the sustainability of the marine environment. With that note, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed to Professor Dr. Muhammad Rijal. Yeah, uh, he is another a great uh, researcher, I think, because his function as the advocate and solicitor of the High Court in Malaysia. So, please, college students, if you want to have further studies on. Uh, the policy, law, enforcement, and so on, I think this is the right uh, person to contact with. Yeah? And Pa Muhammad Rijal has the education from UKM also. He got his PhD in 2009. But before that, he went to University of Wales in the United Kingdom to get his master degree in 1997. So from his presentation, I could uh, draw on the a short conclusion that it is the interconnection plays important role in this uh, management and also interdisciplinary yeah and then when he presented the slides on how to approach i am really happy that i learned uh, valuable things today yeah so we have four uh, sides how to approach that the first one is the power secondly is uh, interest the third knowledge and the fourth one is the forum. So today, actually we have already three out of four because we have interest, we have knowledge to share, and we have forum like this. Actually, we have also some of our government's uh, representatives here because I know from the participants, uh, some of the participants are coming from the Ministry of uh, Fisheries and Marine Affairs. Yeah. Uh, and I think those colleagues who are grouped as the power group, yeah. And hopefully uh, the message from Professor Dr. Mota Muhammad Rijal will be passed to their bosses also. That's my uh, dream, our dream. Well, uh, participants, uh, now we move to the fourth presenters, yeah. After we have journey, the first from the Philippines and then we toward the north to Taiwan, and come back to uh, the south to Malaysia. Now we head to Thailand. Yeah. Would you please welcome Professor Sotawat Benjakul, PhD, who works in Prince Songkla University in Hat Thai, Thailand. And 
He has an expert in food technology, and the title for presentation today is on the cold plasma technology for self life extensions of fish and fish products. So this fourth speaker is on uh, food technology. Yeah, uh, and the first is on aquaculture, and then the second one on uh, management of fisheries and marine resources and the third one i think between uh, management and also social economy so this is really uh, special for our seminar today so the fourth will be on uh, the technology for peace so it is important also for peace security during the pandemic yeah so would you please professor sotawat benjaku time is yours yeah Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jogo, for kind introduction, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So it's my pleasure uh, to uh, serve as a, a speaker for this conference. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to join the conference. Uh, so my talk today is about the co-plasma technology for actual like extension of fish and shellfish uh, and shell pro uh, the fish products. Uh, Sorry. Okay, so fish and fish products are very popular due to its delicacy and also they have a high energy value. And fish and fish product has become very income generator for Thailand and also Indonesia for many decades. Uh, during, uh, after that, the fish undergo deterioration during handling, processing, distribution, and also storage, as indicated by the microbiological changes, chemical and biological biochemical changes, as well as a physical damages. So uh, to prolong the child life or maintain the qualities, uh, several kinds of conventional methods like drying, something smoking have been used for many decades. And also thermal processing has been uh, used for many years, like uh, sterilization using canning or retort, as you can see in the canned products. However, the thermal process uh, can have the, uh, have the many disadvantages, particularly they change the sensory property and also you the native value of the products. Like you can see from here, the canned fish, you can see that it can change in the picture also the flavor uh, when compared with the raw fish. So this is a problem for the using the thermal processing technology. And uh, then non-thermal processing technology has gained increase, increasing attention for a processor, also the consumer, that because they have neg negligible effect on the quality attribute, and they also have the less impact on nutritive uh, nutrient losses, and the energy use is quite a lower when compared with the thermal processing. And one among uh, non-thermal processing, cold plasma technology is one of the uh, technology have gained increasing in attention. What is cold plasma? The cold plasma is the full state of matter. So it starts from solid and change to be a liquid and gases and to plasma. This uh, induced by the high energy to just like change the state of gases to the ionized state like we call plasma. And uh, how the cold plasma is important? So cold plasma is generated by passing a process gas through electric field. So we have to deal with electric field. Electronalyzing from ionization are isolated in this field. And free electron collide with the gas atom and transfer their energy, thus generated high act reactive species. Okay, so this is like, a, uh, what is a cold plasma apparatus? So they, uh, we, we, what we, we use, we use the dielectric barrier discharge so it consists of two flat metal electrodes. Yeah, this one, the first one is high voltage electrode and the ground electrode one. And the high voltage are required to produce discharge for the plasma generation, okay? So the, the gas is, per se gas is between the electrode here. And carrier gas, as mentioned, between electrode can be ionized to form the plasma. And this, I mentioned that, we have two electrodes here, high voltage electrode and ground one. And when we apply the voltages, the discharge filament can be uh, produced and this discharge can uh, uh, bombard or uh, change the gases to the active species. 
So uh, when the air have been used as the process gases, so the gas content, you see, can see that they contain uh, nitrogen, oxygen, argon, or carbon dioxide. So after the uh, become plasma, they can be, become the charred species, like here. You can see argon become the, like a cation, and also other become the positive chart like this. And one thing that the argon, uh, when they uh, interact with the uh, water, they can become hydroxyl radical. And apart from the charred species, a uh, uh, number of the active species are generated by air plasma, especially for reactive oxygen species like ozone, hydroxyl radicals, you know, hydroxyl radical. And also, since the air con contains the nitrogen, so reactive nitrogen species also generated during plasma a process like this, like nitric oxide, for example, and the, all these kind of active species have the high antimicrobial activities. And how does cold plasma can the, um, inactivate or kill the, uh, the bacteria or microorganism? So reactive oxygen species uh, can induce the lipid oxidation, protein oxidation in the cell. And also they can uh, cause the DNA damage. And also apart from that active species, the charged species can uh, interact with the membrane of the, the bacteria and cause a leakage uh, and then then cause the release of the iron or nutrient from the, the bacteria cell. And then finally, the bacteria or organism is dead. And this is what we uh, we done. So basically, uh, we use in back that erective barrier feature plasma. So firstly, we pack those glycolysis or sample in the back with the uh, prostate gases here like this. And then we place between two electrodes like this. Okay, and then we apply voltage into the the, the sample, and this is uh, the uh, plasma gener generating machine. When we close up here, you can see the, this the electrode with high voltage and this ground one, and we insert the, the sample between the electrode. And in back, it means that in the back, we, it consists of the percent gases. So in this one, we use the argon to oxygen uh, to the ratio of 90 to 10 ratio, and the uh, fish to gas is a three to one ratio. And we use the high voltage 230 voltage. And we vary the treatment time 0, 2.55, 7.5, and 10 minutes. And let's see, we, and in this study, we use the ACNC bass uh, uh, in the, our study because we, it's abundant species in our uh, area. Okay. And take a look from here. You, you can see we, after treatment, we keep the, the uh, sample at the four degrees Celsius up to 15 days. And for the control one, the first bar, we can see that it's like, the TVC total wire work how exceed the limit is maintained to power uh, six CFU per gram at day six. However, for the one that treated with the uh, cold plasma for five to 10 minutes, they still have the very low uh, TVC, which is around 50% of the control one. And uh, we can extend the, child, uh, the TVC under the limit up to 12 days, you know, when we treat it with the cold plasma for five to 10 minutes. And similar trend was observed for the psychophilic bacteria count during storage up to 15 days. And also the similar trend, you can see that the lower psycho uh, pseudomonad count was found in the, uh, the sample treated with the coplasma for five to 10 minutes. Actually, uh, pseudomonad is one of the dominant bacteria causing the uh, spoilage of the fish and fish product. That's why we monitor this uh, bacteria. And when we take a look for the quality in, uh, indices, we take a look for total water based content. And the similar thing is uh, what observed uh, to the TBC is you can see from here that the control have the highest TBB content, while the one that treated with the uh, coplasma at five to 10 minutes, they have the lower TBB. The similar thing we also observe for the uh, pH. That because what are the, some basic compound they can increase the pH of the, the sample, and when we take a look from uh, TBRs, uh, where you stand for thiobarbituric acid reactive substances, this indicator indicate the lipid oxidation uh, products, and you can see that with increasing the uh, treatment times, the TBRs where you increase, that's indicating that cold plasma with active species can induce lipid oxidation in the sea bass slices. So this is a problem, all right? So what happened? Why the lipid oxidation increased? 
as I mentioned previously that the plasma generate several kinds of active species. So they abstract the hydrogen from the fatty acid here and become radical. And radicals in the present oxygen, you know, they can become a chloroxyl radical and they can ab uh, abstract the hydrogen from other fatty acid and become hydroperoxide here. Hydroperoxide is not stable and decompose to several high products like aldehyde, ketone, alcohol that we can feel like they have uh, like a sting smell or rancid smell. All right. So uh, to uh, tackle the problem, we decided to use the uh, antioxidant, both the uh, natural extract and also like ascorbic acid. So we use coconut husk extract, you know, so, and also ascorbic acid at 10, uh, at 100 and 200 ppm. To produce the coconut husk extract is guy straightforward. You know, we start from the coconut husk, which is abundant in Indonesia also. I think a lot of tree, uh, coconut tree in Indonesia. And we just make it a powder. And then we extract using 60% ethanol with the uh, 10 gram and add the 350 ml in there and stir for three hours, filter, and then freeze dry. And we can up with the extract. And we found that the extract have the very high antioxidant activities. Okay, all right. Apart from antioxidant activities, the extract also have the uh, very high antimicrobial activities. So we test, we test with the serocyte of uh, microenzyme like a pseudomonas one that the, the, the major course for spoilage. We also test for BBO parahemorrhagicus, Escherichia coli, Listeria monocytogenes, Staphylococcus aureus. And you can take a look from here, compare with the what, without treatment, I mean treatment one, you can see after we treated with the extract, you can see those chi cells is chi have the poor and have injury of the cell membrane and cause the death finally here. For all the microorganisms, you can see that the, the, the change in the cell morphology. All right, so that's why we decided to use this guy through a uh, true uh, antioxidant is include the ascorbic and ethanolic coconut extract at two level. And we, uh, from the previous study, we fixed the time for treatment at five minutes of treatment of plasma and still use alcohol and oxygen at ratio of 90 to 10, all right? And then we can see here, and we keep it up to 18 uh, day, and we found that the control one, you can the, the, the first bar, you can see that the rich, uh, the, they have the TVC, TVC above the limit, 10 to power 6 CFU per gram at day six. However, for the one that treated with the um, eternal co uh, coconut, coconut extract at 200 ppm, you can see the lower, the TVC, that because the, the extract also have the antimicrobial activities. And also the similar trend we can follow with the cyclophilic bacterial code. Okay, all right, you can see the lowest the cyclophilic bacterial code when the treated with the coconut extract at 200 ppm. And also the similar trend we have found with the uh, pseudomonas. And from this one overall, you can see that we can extend the child life up to 15 days when we treated with the 200 ppm of uh, ethanolic coconut extract together with plasma for five minutes. And when we take a look at total uh, water based content, similar trend, we can see from here at the, the uh, day uh, 15, you can see the one treated with the 200 ppm, the ethanolic coconut extract, they have the lowest TVB content. Also they have the lowest pH and uh, Interestingly, after we treated with the uh, antioxidant, it means the uh, coconut extract at 200 ppm, you can see that the TV, uh, TBS value representing the secondary oxygen product is decreased drastically when compared with the control one. This indicating that the use of natural extract, particularly from the coconut extract, can reduce or prevent the oxidation effectively. And uh, last, uh, the slide, we also uh, monitor or study of, of the degradation of protein by monitor uh, TCA suripeptide. And you can see from the, the picture that the control one, when compared with the, uh, the sample treated with the plasma for, for five minutes, you can see that the treatment, the treated sample have the higher TCA suripeptide. This indicated that they have the degradation of muscle protein take place in the, this sample. However, when we treat with the uh, coconut extract at the 200 ppm or ascorbic at 200 ppm, the TCA surfeta is decreased when compared with the, 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 the one that treated without any uh, additives. The same, uh, similarly, 
when we monitor total carbonyl content, this indicates the protein oxidation in the muscle protein. And we found that the, the one that treated with five minutes, they have the highest the total carbonyl content. However, when we treated with the uh, coordinate extract at 200 ppm, the lowest carbonyl content was found. So this is indicating that the treatment of the coordinate extract or anti uh, other antioxidant can lower protein oxidation of the sample treated with the whole plasma. Right, so this is almost the last slide. Uh, as I mentioned previously that the whole plasma generates active species and active species can induce the protein oxidation uh, 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 radicals generated. Since the radical is not stable, so they aggregate together, become the cross-linking. However, the uh, radicals can, our active species can uh, induce fragmentation of protein as indicated by the increase in TCA superpeptide, as I mentioned previously. So overall, the use of antacinin uh, together with the plasma is being effective mean to lower the protein association. So I would like to end up my, my summary that Co-plasma in appropriate condition, especially at, uh, in combination with antacidant, could effectively extend the shell line of the crystallizes during the refrigerated storage. And co-plasma should be further exploited uh, for quality maintenance or shell line extension for fish uh, as the novel non-thermal processing technology. So thank you so much for attention. Many thanks, Edith, Professor Sotawat Benjakul. Another interesting topic, yeah, and another idea, I think, because by using the coconut husk, I think can be applied really well in Indonesia, the Philippines, sure. Malaysia, Vietnam, Myanmar, yeah. And also, I think there is another option, yeah, because in Southeast Asia, we have uh, parts of palm oil plantation. Maybe we can use the palm oil husk also. So, this is the good. Uh, uh, inspiration yeah for our colleagues who are attending this seminar so we can arrange the research with a similar methods but using uh, different materials i think yeah from the cold plasma application i think we can learn also that the time efficiency is really there yeah because you don't need too long and also according to professor sotawa there are three key three keys in uh, preserving this uh, fish meat yeah about the quality delicacy and nutritive but uh, would you please uh, accept me i propose one more aspect professor and that is the price yeah if you have a uh, good quality if you have a uh, delicacy and the taste and then the nutritive value then the price of course will follow yeah so this is very uh, interesting and we can use it as the variable for our research yeah uh, yeah. Before I let the fifth presenter, I just want to add the information about Professor Sotawa. He is uh, a Fulbright Scholarship alumni, yeah? and he did his PhD from Oregon State University in 1997. You know, uh, if someone has the Fulbright Scholarship, it means he or she is a very, very bright person. Yeah. So that's why uh, this also shown by his dedication and uh, products of his expertise. Uh, he is indeed included 1% of researchers who the papers most cited. Yeah? So if you look at the citation, then Professor Sotawat Benjakul is there among only 1% of researcher in the world. So it's really something, yeah? Okay, thank you once again, Professor Sotawa. Uh, I hope you thank have you so nice much. weather in Songkla, yeah? In, in uh, South Thailand, Southern Thailand. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, now we move to the fifth presenter, will be the ladies, then the six and the seven present, uh, fifth and sixth presenters are the ladies. But before that, I would like to mention today, I wear this tanja. Yeah? So this is to make participants not too serious, not too, uh, yeah. Uh, I wear this uh, tanja on my head. So tanja is uh, head coverage from the male in Malay cultures. Yeah, not only in Rio actually, but also in North Sumatra, maybe in Thailand or in Malaysia, yeah. So this is uh, really special and 
worn with, during the special occasion. So like this, this is a special occasion. That's why uh, I wear this. Yeah, and maybe when you go to Rio or Pekanbaru, uh, we can uh, company you to buy this uh, one for you, or we will give one for you. Yeah, particularly on the mail, of course. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. And I would like to invite Associate Professor Natra Fatih Muhammad Iksan. Uh, saya panggil Ibu. Ibu Natra ya, uh, beliau scientist from UPM ya, and actually we are also very thankful because uh, she holds a very strategic position as well as the uh, vice president of Malaysia Fishery Society, and also he actives in World Aquaculture Asia Pacific Chapter. Yeah. So all presenters today are very, very, uh, yeah, great persons, great researchers, and will be a very great example for of us, particularly our younger generation, of course. So Ibu Natra will present her presentation on socio microbiology of bacteria in the aquatic ecosystems. Again, this is a very uh, tempting, yeah? I think we will learn many, many also from her. Ibu, silakan for 15 minutes. Okay, terima uh, kasih. Assalamualaikum and um, good morning everyone. Uh, it's morning here in Malaysia. Uh, first, I would also like to thank the organizer for inviting me as one of the speaker uh, and and basically uh, so that I can share some of my experience in, in the world of microbes. All right. So this is the topic of my presentation today. It's more on the social microbiology of bacteria in the ecosystem. And uh, I'm from UPM. I'm currently having uh, different hats in UPM. I'm from the Department of Aquaculture. I'm also uh, an associate researcher in the laboratory of aquatic animal health and therapeutics in the bioscience UPM and also an uh, interim member of the of Sustainable Aquaculture in the International Institute of Aquaculture and Aquatic Sciences, uh, UPM. Okay. So when you have the time uh, to come to Malaysia, I uh, can bring you to these three different places okay, where we do a lot of uh, aquaculture studies and also uh, aquatic sciences in general. Okay, uh, these are basically the outline of my presentation today. Uh, first, I'll be talking about vector processing, introducing you the unique world of bacteria, socializing with each other, uh, and how it impacts uh, the other microbes and also the other pores in the aquatic ecosystem. And lastly, on uh, the role of foreign sensing inhibitor. All right. Bacteria. Bacteria, before this, uh, people, researchers, they always regard that bacteria, they are isolated organism, mundane organism, uh, not, soci not sociable like, my, like human. But uh, it seems that more and more researchers, um, you know, a lot of studies show that indeed they are very social, they are just like human, okay, they communicate with each other. Uh, where from their communication, they sense and respond to the to the environment, and they alter their behavior depending on the population density and sometimes depending on the signal molecules that are being produced uh, by them and also by their friends. Okay, how did they communicate between each other? Uh, they use the use and produce uh, signal molecules, also known as auto auto inducer. And there are a number of signal molecules that are uh, available, that are known, but the most common uh, signal molecules are known as acetylated homosterin lactone or HL. And this has been found in a number of different gram negative bacteria where uh, it has a great impact in various ecological niches. And bacteria, okay, uh, they are able to produce these signal molecules and when they reach a certain threshold, uh, the signal molecules are being detected. And from there, uh, a number of activities or target genes are being re regulated by this uh, mechanism known as quorum sensing. Uh, in fact, 
uh, in terms of HL, there are also different uh, type of HL uh, depending on the number of acyl chain, uh, which are mostly used for intraspecies communication. So is the bacteria, they can be basically their, their PP communicator, uh, um, you know, they, they can either communicate within their own species and or they can also communicate within uh, the different species. Uh, and uh, while communicating, they basically use different languages. Uh, I think uh, in Indonesia also, they have different sort of language, like uh, not only Bahasa Indonesia, in, in Malaysia also, we have different languages. So back here also, are having different languages. Okay, uh, and then uh, certain bacteria such as River Cambly, uh, other than using uh, HL, okay, uh, they are also capable of uh, producing and also uh, detecting different types of signal molecules other than HL. So they are also um, having a signal molecules known as AI2 or auto in situ or CA1. So instead of HL, there are Two are the different types of signal molecules. Okay. And while the HL are basically used for intraspecies, uh, the AI2 are basically used for interspecies communication, so between different species. And the CI1 is uh, a language, a better language that I use conserve, I mean, it is being used uh, only in vivo species. So, uh, you know, uh, other than that, there are also all sorts of uh, signal molecules uh, um, can be uh, different types uh, depending on, on the species of, of bacteria. Okay, and these are some of the structures, uh, the common scores of signal molecules uh, that are known now. Right. So, what are the impacts of bacteria uh, having this communication between each other? Uh, first is they regulate the gene uh, or activity based on the concentration level of signal molecules. Uh, when there are high signal molecules, uh, they have uh, these types of activity. Uh, and then when they are low, they are they have a different uh, set of activities. So genes are switched on and off according to the presence of the signal molecules. And certain phenotypes are being controlled by parenting. So what kind of phenotype? All right. So these are examples of one uh, type of phenotypes that, that are being controlled by consensus. This is actually our, uh, you know, from the, from the space, this is actually uh, our Earth, right? And then you can see here, okay, at your uh, right-hand side, there is this luminescence uh, of review, okay? And then um, when we zoom, okay, when we zoom the, uh, this image of luminescence in, of review, this is actually um, the sea, all right? With um uh with with uh, you know it's very large very large luminescence at the sea being de detected from the face uh as large as two hundred fifty kilometers and when uh, scientists uh, took samples from the water uh they observed that this is actually bacteria uh communicating with each other you know so there are a lot of signal molecules that are being produced um in this uh, in 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 the sea. All right, and then uh, when the bacteria in the sea, you know, um, they detect it and uh, so they know their friends there, so they start to produce this luminescence. All right, and uh, scientists have been isolating this bacteria, so it's, you can also observe uh, this phenomenon in, in your lab, okay, uh, where uh, light production are being regulated. Uh, by the density of bacteria. So luminescence are being produced when there, there are only, um, you know, um, when the bacteria is reaching a, a quorum of high density. Uh, and then uh, indeed, the first discovery of quorum sensing is actually from, um, from a squid, okay, where there's a symbiosis between uh, a type of bacteria, bacteria known as river fissuri, okay. And uh, this squid actually act as a host and give a shelter for this uh, Weibo. And in return, Weibo is providing light to avoid predator and also acid feeding. And this light, uh, this uh, light, okay, also being regulated by quorum sensing. So when there's a high Weibo, uh, it produces light. So it, in return, um, squid is benefiting uh, from from this. Okay. Okay. Other than um, 
illnesses. There are also a, a wide range of phenotypes that are being controlled by consenting. Uh, and then, okay, we have bifilum, the pigment, antibiotics, adulation, pollution, bicorrhation, and quantification. And for example, bifilum itself, uh, you know, uh, when, uh, when bifilum is formed, uh, 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 studies have shown that um, uh, through this quantity mechanism, uh, bifilum could basically tolerate uh, 1,000 times higher of antibiotics compared uh, when they are when they are single cell. Okay, so this shows uh, how important is this mechanism in 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 the ecology in the ecology or in the environment. Other than um, blood formation and other, uh, it seems that bacteria, okay, other than communicating between themselves, okay, uh, there, there are also studies have shown that bacteria could also communicate between uh, different kingdoms, okay, such as the algae and also, um, you, know, um, you know, for example, algae, all right, uh, algae, um, of, uh, we don't, we, for, for, for now, we didn't know that algae could basically produce signal molecules, not, but we know that algae can recognize the signal molecules of bacteria. And uh, where we have example of uh, one type of microalgae, uh, it seems that um, you know, production of signal molecules from the bacteria increase the growth of that algae. And there's also other studies, uh, there's one type of macroalgae, the seaweed, okay, where the, the spore of the seaweed only settle on bifilum with signal molecules. So without the signal molecules, um, there is no spore settling, but with the signal molecules of the bacteria signal molecules, the spore start, start to settle, all right? Other than that, there are also studies, uh, you know, uh, on the induction of muscle settlement. Uh, it is also shown that bifilum of bacteria, and that may be related by consenting, uh, somehow induce this bacterial settlement of muscle. All right, so this shows that you know uh, it, it, it has a great impact. All right, and uh, of course, uh, uh, all of us know that bacteria are the most common colonizers on the surface of microalgae, and consenting has been playing a, a, a significant role on this. Okay, other than the seaweed, other than microalgae, uh, there are. Uh, there, there are wide interaction between microalgae and bacteria also, which are also be related by consenting that I would discuss uh, further after this. Uh, indeed, in aquaculture, uh, because I'm from the depa uh, aquaculture department, all right, uh, 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 consenting basically play an important role, especially in terms of regulating the virulence of um, uh, towards towards uh, different aquatic organisms in aquaculture. Uh, uh, among aquaculture pathogens that are uh, being, being studied to show, uh, you know, to use this cross regulation, uh, the common one are the aeromonas, aquacilla, of course, the vibro, streptococcus, and also the sumia. And uh, these are uh, now our group is focusing on, and we are looking at river plumbicus and perhelvi, which are causing this what we call as early mortality syndrome in Pinus wanami. And uh, we also observe that consenting is actually playing a role uh, in this, in this, um, you know, this type of people um, in basically uh, inducing um, uh, the disease. Okay, but it's still, uh, it's still, we are still uh, in this future further in, in terms of the mechanism. So, yeah. Other than that, uh, this has been published before uh, by, by, uh, by, by our group and also by different groups in, in the aquaculture communities, uh, where uh, there are indeed a uh, number of uh, uh, the, uh, studies that shows that, uh, that prove that consensus regulate the rules of review in different holes, okay, and okay, other than uh, the, the, the shrimp, there are also uh, you know, uh, studies that consensus Cause mortality in type grouper, roti and also artemia. So that is why, okay, since quant sensing play an important role in terms of the ruler, uh, people are also looking at quant sensing inhibitor or QSI. All right, so um, so this has been uh, used as a new approach to treat bacterial disease. 
Okay, what differentiate between uh, antibacterial and export sensing? Antibacterial basically uh, kill or it activate the mechanism uh, which basically can um, lead, lead to high selective pressure and cause multiple resistance. But uh, in terms of anti quarantine sensing, uh, anti -quarantine sensing uh, instead of killing okay, uh, bacteria, it basically only interfere uh, with the signal molecules. And uh, this somehow allows the natural immune uh, to develop and also take control, with, uh, which somehow leads to a lower selective pressure for resistant development. All right, so how people, uh, you know, uh, how, can, how can we, uh, how can we basically uh, study uh, quantum sensing inhibitor? People, researchers are using uh, different biosensors and there are different resources uh, available to study quantum sensing. We have uh, the common one, the chromobacter valsia, and then we also have uh, mutants, uh, you know, uh, where uh, all the phenotypes of this uh, biosensor tree are basically regulated by quantum sensing. And there are also, uh, we have seed molecules also being uh, sold uh, by a different supplier, big supplier Sigma. So you can always use the seed molecules. So by uh, putting seed molecules, the, the, the phenotypes are being regulated. And if you have a candidate of consent beta uh, of inhibiting these uh, phenotypes uh, regulated by consenting, so you, you get uh, your, your consent beta. And what type of targets uh, of uh, this inhibition activity? It can be in terms of signal production, right? In terms of the signal molecules itself. Okay, if, if signal production, we are basically blocking uh, the synthesis, okay? And also uh, if the synthesis protein or the signal molecules is basically inhibiting the signal molecule itself, degrading the signal molecules, okay? Or uh, we can also target on the signal detection. So basically by blocking the receptor. Uh, indeed, the first uh, quantum inhibitor is actually uh, found in the aquatic ecosystem where uh, it's actually uh, from a macroalgae or seaweed known as this lepulcra. And this lepulcra is producing a compound known as halogenated pyranoid, uh, where uh, uh, the, uh, the researcher who found this observed that this lepulcra, uh, compared to the other seaweed, uh, it, 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 it basically had. had a low uh, bifurcation formation. So when they study further, uh, it is actually uh, this halogenated pyranone uh, produced by this TV are able to disrupt HL and also the multi-channel system uh, by vibro. But somehow uh, uh, it is also known that halogenated pyranone, this compound, at high concentration is uh, quite toxic. Right. Uh, so in Malaysia, we also conducted a same study. We, we collected sample from Johor and also New Milan. And where uh, uh, we basically uh, choose our sampling site depending on the type of ecosystem. One is more on um, you know a, a site where there are a lot of reclamation there, a lot of activity, human activities going on, and there's also Tanjung Adang here, uh, uh, seaweed, uh, where it is uh, in a healthy ecosystem. And uh, we basically process a sample. We use uh, the biosensor common bacteria to look at our quantum inhibition activity. Uh, and we observe that uh, you know uh, quite a number of seaweed uh, collected from this sampling site uh, showed quantum inhibition activity. Where here we notice that the purple color uh, uh, produced by the bat the biosensor are being inhibited by the uh, this type of seaweed known also known as Soliaria robusta. And there are a number of activities, okay, depending on, on the, uh, the sampling site. And when we look further in, in terms of the compound, we also observe that uh, there are a number of uh, compounds produced by different types of seaweed uh, in bit of processing. Uh, Excuse in, me. Oh, yes. Ibu Natra. Uh -huh. Two more minutes, please. Two more minutes, okay. All right, okay. And we also observed that, uh, you know, a number of foreign sensing uh, inhibition activity for the seaweed uh, mostly comes from the healthy one, okay, compared to the, to the um, you know, sample site with a lot of human activity. And uh, the same, uh, you know, find, find, find finding are also uh, being observed uh, by, this, uh, by the scientists. 
to a diagnosis that a healthy ecosystem contribute to a healthy uh, bacterial community. Okay, other than the seaweed, uh, we also observe that uh, microalgae uh, also shoot the, the same activity where we have an, quite a number of microalgae species showing inhibition activities of corn sensei. Okay, uh, among them are the common ones that are being used in aquaculture. Right? And other than that, okay, it's just that in terms of uh, what type of metabolites, or, uh, most of it are basically unknown. And other than the microalgae, we also observe that bacteria associated with microalgae are also uh, for this uh, inhibition activity of corn sensing. Okay, and what is interesting about this is uh, somehow uh, some of these um, bacteria, which is inhibiting corn sensing, could also uh, in somehow um, increase the growth. So if there is a symbiotic activity uh, between these bacteria, uh, that are producing concentration activity with, 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 with the microalgae or the seaweed they are, they are residing with. All right? So this is just to show that, uh, you know, uh, bacteria from microalgae can also uh, inhibit uh, signal molecules of different types of signal molecules in general. Okay? This is just to show that uh, there's symbiotic activity okay, between the bacteria and also microalgae. So, uh, bacteria could improve uh, the growth of microalgae, right? And then uh, also we observe it in, in photobiotic. Okay, at big scale, it is also uh, the bacteria can improve. And at the same time, it improves the survival of um, aquaculture organisms. In, in our case, we're using shrimp or prawn. And we observe that uh, when consenting in the uh, beam placed um, together, uh, the survival are higher. Right. So, in terms of activity, uh, uh, bacteria is constantly inhibitor. Okay, uh, although uh, some bacteria do produce contact signal, uh, there are also bacteria which produce a constant, which can inhibit uh, constant, the, the, their friends' constant signal by producing uh, enzymes such as lactulase, uh, the carboxylase, acylase, and DNA. All right, uh, so this is why, um, you know, I, in, in my case, okay, uh, we are looking now. Uh, how can um, you know uh, concentric inhibitors such as microalgae uh, be being used, you know, can be used as a spawn tool, especially in aquaculture? Okay, we are now looking uh, really uh, you know uh, where our research is mostly focused in uh, looking at you know system as integrated microscopic aquaculture, and also now we are also trying to elucidate what kind of agar metabolites that are responsible for consistent inhibition activity. And however, there are still a lot of things you know, need to be studied. Okay, first is understanding uh, more thoroughly in terms of the microbial ecology uh, surrounding you know, uh, the, the ecosystem. And in terms of, okay, uh, you know, uh, in terms of clean uh, in terms of applying also uh, this to, to the field, uh, there are a lot of things to be studied. Okay, and, uh, and we are looking forward to share with you, you know, uh, for perhaps in, in another in another conference. Okay. All right. Um, with the hope that later by understanding this communication, the interaction between microbes, the host, it will somehow lead to uh, better microbial management and uh, for better uh, host and environmental health. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, Professor, uh, Professor Natra, Ibu Natra, yeah. Another intriguing topic that inspired us also to conduct a similar or further studies in this topic. Yeah, indeed, under uh, the water column or beneath the surface, according to her, there are exciting communication through signaling. Yeah, even the signaling occurs between the group of uh, organisms. Yeah. There is a cross kingdom signaling. That's very interesting. Yeah, uh, she gave the example on how the algae and bacteria to have this uh, signaling for each other. Yeah, and I think this is very applicable for the fish uh, health, and this can be applied by using the biological means to control the disease and so on, as what uh, Ibu Natra mentioned to us. Yeah. Another 
uh, interesting topic and i think this seminar is really really fruitful yeah uh, at the moment we have five uh, topics and all are very interesting yeah okay uh, the presenter number six because i i don't want to see the six presenter it sounds that the presenter is sick or ill yeah <laughs> so she is the lady from manila yeah uh, the ateneo de manila university in the philippines as far as i know this is among the best universities in uh, the philippines yeah and professor associate professor janis alano ragasa will deliver the topic on simotoide this is a tiny crustacea from isopod yeah and big ice cut yeah from batangas the philippines so again this is also applicable throughout the marine waters in southeast asia yeah so please janis i give you time for 15 minutes thank you sir joko so good good morning everyone i'm janis era gaza so i'm here to present to you today, today a research done in my laboratory and it's entitled Simothoidi isopoda prevalence in big ice cad cellar chrononophthalmos from Batangas, Philippines. Oops. Yeah. So, um, simothoid isopods have been known to infect various kinds of fish, including the big ice cad cellar chrononophthalmos, a small pelagic fish belonging in the family Karangidae. The big ice cad has a wide distribution across tropical and subtropical waters. It is a major source of food for predators in higher trophic levels and for humans as an inexpensive source of uh, protein, especially for families belonging to the low socioeconomic status. The big ice cad is said to be the third most produced commercial and marine fish in the Philippines with more than 110,000 metric tons of the fish produced back in 2018. Moreover, the value of the big ice cad uh, production from both marine and commercial fishery exceeded 164.5 million US dollars in 2018, highlighting its importance in the economy. So the family Simothoidae parasitizes both bony and cartilaginous fishes. The parasite actually drains nutrients from the host hemolymph and blood. Parasitic isopod infestations have caused really a great damage to fisheries and aquaculture industries by reducing the growth of many marine species. So despite being a major threat to the fishing industry, there is only a small number of studies on the infection of simothoid isopods in big ice cads in the Philippines. Um, most recently, the first record of Norilica indica in big ice cad has been reported. So the parasites were found to be in the branchial cavities of the fish, and a correlation was found between the length of the parasite and its non-ovigorous female and male hosts. Although other studies have also reported simothoidy infection in the Philippines, None were observed in big ice cad, and more importantly, uh, those, those, those studies are quite outdated. Since the fishing industry is a significant part of the Philippine economy, it is important to determine the scope of infection of these isopods in local waters. Hence, the aim of the present study was to determine simothoid isopod prevalence, intensity, and host parasite length correlations in Batanga source big ice cad hosts. We did this research during the start of the pandemic uh, for a period of one academic year. We used convenient sampling method focusing on, on the family simothoidy on big ice cads, which we bought from the local market. So the methodologies were composed of three parts, sample collection, isopod examination, and data analysis. Sample collection and preparation was done over the course of a five-week collection period. Ten freshly caught big ice cats were purchased weekly from Tagaytay City, Cavite, were freshly caught 
fish from Batangas fishers were sourced. So we used convenient sampling and a total of 50 big ice cads were collected, divided into five weekly sample sets of 10 big ice cads. Each big ice cad was measured in length in terms of millimeter and was then dissected to reveal the, reveal the buccal and branchial cavities, which were examined for the presence of isopods. Each isopod was extracted with forceps measured in length. The isopods were preserved in individual vials filled with 70% 70, 70 ethanol. Each isopod was then examined under 25 times or 25x magnification. The dorsal and ventral sides of each isopod were photo documented. The genera or species and the sex that is non ovigorous female, ovigorous female, and male of the isopods were individually determined with a dichotomous key. After each isopod had been identified to the genus or species level and its sex determined, separate prevalence and mean intensity calculations were employed. Prevalence and mean intensity per genera were calculated for each sample set and for all samples. The lengths of each set, sample set of fish and isopods per sex were plotted to observe for any correlations between host length and isopod length, which could suggest possible host parasite growth relationships. So let's look at the results. Let me see if my, okay, sorry. So there, uh, the isopods were determined as cymothoid using the dichotomous key and identified up to the species level due to the clarity of detail of the key and the relatively stark dif distinctions between cymothoid genera. There are two species identified, Norilica indica and Glossobius impressus. So this is Norilica indica. This is Glossobius impressus. Of the 25 isopods collected, there were three ovigorous females, 11 were non-ovigorous females, and 11 were males. The ovigorous females, as seen here, there, uh, is, di is distinguished from non-ovigorous females, as seen here, uh, by the eggs or larvae inside the marsupia of the ovigorous female. Although the ovigorous females were found to be smaller than the non-ovigorous females. 50 specimens of escrumen of thalmus were collected and measured. The lengths of the big ice cads samples had an average of 202 millimeters. A total of 25 isopods were found in the branchial and buccal cavities of 15 out of the 50 different specimens of big ice cad. 24 isopods in the branchial cavities were identified as N indica. One isopod in the buccal cavity was identified as G impressus. The lengths of the 11 non-ovigorous females and three ovigorous female isopods had an average of 20 millimeters, sorry, 28 millimeters and 23 millimeters respectively. Female specimens were typically accompanied by their male counterpart of the species or were not accompanied at all, except for the unexpected occurrence of both N. indica and G. impressus females in one big ice cad. The lengths of the 11 male isopods had an average of 14 millimeters. Male specimens were narrower, smaller, and symmetrical than the female isopods. Males always accompanied female isopods or were otherwise absent. The collected G. impressus specimen was an ovigorous female measuring 20 millimeters in length. The G. impressus specimen was smaller, symmetrical, and less ovate when viewed dorsally compared to the female and indica specimens. All of the 10 big ice cad samples from the third collection batch were infected with isopods compared to only five out of the 10 infected samples from the fifth collection batch. Female isopods from the fifth batch were larger than those of the third batch, and all female specimens from the fifth, fifth batch were also found to be non-ovigorous. So this is your Glossobius impressus. This is a female and indica, and this is your male uh, and indica. 
in terms of size relationships, a relatively strong positive exponential correlation between non vigorous female isopod length and big ice cad length is suggested. This indicates that as the length of the fish increases, the length of the isopod increases at an exponentially decreasing rate up to a certain extent. The male isopod length, on the other hand, suggests a moderate positive parabolic correlation. Additionally, if you look at the figure, the vigorous female length against fish length had only three nonlinear data points, making it really difficult to determine if there's any correlation. While a positive correlation between isopod length and fish length has been observed in several studies, such is not immediately indicative of causation. Thus, cymothoid isopods do not choose their host based on size. Overall, the lack of a correlation between isopod length and fish length is also evident in how the data points of the same sex have a relatively wide horizontal spread with little vertical spread in relation to each other. In terms of the affected cavity location in respective big ice cad hosts, there also seem to be no trend in relation to sex or length. The isopods choose their hosts based on space availability in the branchial cavity and therefore grow with the host. So cymothoid prevalence and mean intensity were calculated at 30% and 1.6 respectively. To date, only one study has investigated the prevalence and mean intensity of N. indica infection in S. crumenophthalmus in the Philippines. In the present study, the, a total prevalence of 40.7, uh, sorry, the present study cal calculated a lower prevalence of 30% and lower mean intensity of 1.6 compared to the 40.7 percent prevalence and 10.5 mean intensity for 81 samples in the former or in the other study. There are, however, several other studies that have been conducted in neighboring Southeast Asian countries, which showed varied prevalence and mean intensities ranging from 1.64 to 85 percent and 1 to 1.6 respectively. Several studies have not uh, included the number of infected fish or mean intensity, making it really difficult to describe trends between countries beyond prevalence rates. The differences in the prevalence can be attributed to the variability of the populations of cymothoid isopods. Cymothoid populations are said to be irregular. However, the highest diversity of isopods occurs here in Southeast Asia. Although cymothoid populations are available, the breeding seasons of the host fish were also found to be consistent. Isopod prevalence rates are affected by the breeding season of the host fish. And since the spawning season had already taken place during the time of the study, uh, the increased host population in September most likely pro provided the isopods greater chance to infect more fish. Host populations and its breeding season are not the only factors that can affect isopod prevalence, we also have abiotic factors such as depth and movements of the water and weather conditions as well. So to conclude, we actually collected and identified isopod samples up to the species level and categorized them based on their sex. The prevalence and mean intensity values we calculated were comparable with data from other Southeast Asian studies. And we found that there is no correlation between a vigorous female length and male length. And we also saw a possible correlation between non vigorous female isopod length and fish host length. So thank you very much. I would like to thank this, uh, take this opportunity to thank the organizing community for giving me this chance to present in this prestigious conference. So thank you very much and have a good day. Many thanks indeed, Professor Janis Alanoragasa, for another interesting topic. I think the research that you have done with your group can be also well applied in Indonesian, Malaysian, Vietnamese, and also Thai uh, marine waters because 
this uh, species of fish is very common in Southeast Asia. And also this is important to pass the message to the community that cleaning and cooking properly is very important yeah, because indeed this fish also hosts of some parasites. That's yeah. what I can learn. And I think we can use it also as the materials for our community extension in the future. Yeah? So sure. once again, the chosen presenter today, I mean, Associate Professor Janice also has a very extensive record in her career. Yeah? So she graduates from Kagoshima University for her PhD in 2013. Yeah? And her works is very fast, very diverse from uh, fish nutrition to immunostimulant, also in the biochemical and even in the aspect of limnology. So I think this is a very special scientist also that is really uh, thankful for us to have her today among our presenters, yeah? So many, many thanks once again to uh, Ibu Janis, yeah, for nice presentation. Now we move to the last uh, scientist who will present his works and I am very proud of him. I mean, we very proud of him, the Dean Director, because he was our students. Yeah? And now he becomes one of the most prominent scientists in our faculty. Yeah? Uh, Dr. Indra Suharman finished his bachelor in 1994 from UNRI, and then in 2000, he got his master's from, if not I'm mistaken, from uh, Asian Institute of Technology in Bangkok. Yeah? And also in 2009, he got his PhD from Tumsa, Tokyo, uh, Japan. Yeah? And today I would like to give Pak Indra time for 15 minutes. So Pak Indra, time is yours. Okay. Halo, Pak Indra. Oke. Okay. Okay. Halo. Thank you, uh, moderator. Sorry, there is a little bit uh, technical uh, errors in this uh, system. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, actually, I am the latest, uh, the last invited speaker in this session. Uh, first of all, allow me to introduce myself. I am uh, Indra Swarman from uh, Department of uh, Aquaculture, Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science, uh, University of Riau, Kanbaru, Indonesia. Uh, in this opportunity, I would like to share our uh, work entitled Application of uh, Biotechnology to Improve Plant Speed Ingredient. So come to the background, uh, the demand of, uh, for animal protein, especially uh, of fish, increases along with the increasing population growth, higher living standard, and rising public awareness of the importance of role that fish as a food group play in healthy diet. Uh, this slide, you can see the Indonesia overall uh, fish consumption show the increasing trend year by year, even though uh, not very high. One of the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries program that's attempt to increase people awareness regarding fish consumption is through the uh, Enjoy Eating Fish movement. And then we can call in Bahasa Indonesia, uh, Gerakan Gemar Makan Ikan. One of the effort 
that can be done to meet the increasing demand of the fish based animal protein is through aquaculture activities. Aquaculture has been contributing significantly to food security and poverty elevation. From this figure can be seen that global production of fish has been increasing over recent year from 20 million tons in 1950 to 178.5 million ton in 2018. The total global capture fishery reached a record 96.4 million ton while in the aquaculture industry is responsible for the impressive growth in the supply of fish for human consumption and produce around 62.1 million ton of fish in 19 in 2018. So the increase in aquaculture production is closely uh, to the increase in aqua feed, which is the largest component of the total cost of production. The cost of the feed uh, ingredient is increasing while uh, market costs for the culture fish species have remained or decreasing. The increasing cost of the feed ingredient mean that there is a need to improve pitch utilization in the fish diet. So the use of locally alternative uh, feed ingredient has been used to overcome the problem of the high cost in the protein sources such as from fish meal and soybean meal that are almost imported from the outside. So even though the many plants have been used as a fish feed ingredient, However, the use is very limited because of the higher crude uh, fiber content, low protein, uh, the presence of several anti nutritional factor, and also low digestibility of the material. Plants uh, ingredient content of anti nutritional factor such as protease inhibitor, phytase, saponin, tannin, which can have negative impact on the intestinal function. One way to enable the extensive use of plant feed ingredient by increasing the nutritional value and minimize the anti-nutritional factors is by using biotechnological process. Over the last few years, new fermentation or processing technology have been introduced as a way to improve the nutritional value of the material, which may broaden uses of the such uh, ingredient. So what is the biotechnology? Biotechnology is a technique that uses living organism or substance to make or modify a product to improve plants or animal or to develop microorganism for specific purpose, according to the Kayang 2013. Biotechnology application improve the performance of animal and animal based product through consumption of improved nutrition. Biotechnology has the potential to improve the productivity of animal by increasing in growth, carcass quality and reproduction, improve nutritional quality, safety food, improve health and welfare of animal, and reduce the waste through more efficient utilization. This biotechnological process includes solid state uh, fermentation or SSF and the use of the exogenous enzymes. There are a number of biotechnological which use microorganism to improve uh, nutritional uh, quality, including digestibility of low quality feed, remote anti-nutrition, and increased acceptability of using enzyme and probiotics. Biotonical options are often for improving ability of feed by conserving locally feed ingredient uh, to feed the vitally by product improving rumen fermentation of fiber feed and enhancing the nutrition value and utilization of agriculture industrial based product. Enzyme can improve nutrient availability from feed stuff, lower feed cost, and reduce the output of waste into the environment. Enzyme uh, are processes bio catalysts, generally of microbial origin that improve feed nutrient ability and by enhancing the digestibility macromolecules and decreasing anti-nutritional factor. 
So this slide showing the zero several enzyme can be used uh, in the fish feed ingredient. We can see here the like uh, amylase, phytase, protease, and fiber degrading already used in several different fish. So uh, what is the rule and function of exonegous uh, enzyme? Uh, the exonegous enzyme might be an important tool to increase the digestibility uh, of plant-based feed ingredient and improve feed efficiency. The addition of exogenous uh, microbial enzyme assists in the breakdown of the plant cell walls and help to release the trapped nutrient from the plant material. Supplementation of the specific enzyme in FIP improve its nutritional value by increasing in digestion efficiency and enzyme help to break down the anti-nutritional factor which are present in the feed ingredient. The phytates also they can decrease the phosphorus excretion up to 50%, which will not only decrease environmental pollution, but also save in, in organic like a phosphor. This slide showing uh, that enzyme uh, produced by microbial fermentation, at the present, a number of microbial enzyme already available in the market. Almost of the product are oriented to the livestock market, but now are promoted for use in aquaculture also. This slide uh, summarizes some trial of enzyme application in aquatic species, most reported st study in the pilot application. You can see from here there are so many enzymes that are used for several uh, species that used to improve the growth and then reduce the anti nutrient factor in the plant uh, uh, ingredient and also they can decrease uh, uh, fiber in the plant uh, protein uh, sources. This slide showing the biotonical process has been used to improve nutrition value of the spiral uh, plant-based feed ingredient, uh, such as water, hyacinth leaf, um, uh, moringa leaf, uh, pistia leaf, lichenal leaf, azola leaf, lemna leaf, and many other uh, plant leaves that possible to use as feed ingredient. So, uh, several experiments have been conducted related to the uh, fermentation process for plant-based feed uh, ingredient. We can see from this slide, it can be observed that the water has been fermented with aspergillus nigger can increase the protein, the crude protein content uh, by as much as 176.67%. Uh, you can see from here, from 656 to 18.15%. And also the crude uh, fiber also decreased uh, here from, uh, uh, from 26.47 to 11.93%. Uh, uh, so the higher reduction of the crude, protein, uh, crude fiber content of the fermented of water has in uh, lip meal was obtained at a dose of 12% as per Negger starter. From this slide also, it can be observed that uh, the sicory and cabbage waste fermented with cow uh, rumen liqueur also can lower the crude fiber and can decrease uh, the crude for five protein content in this material. This uh, according to Adelina et al. 2020. And similarly, the crude fiber of the moria, moriga leaf decreased after fermentation with a mixture of bacteria and increased the crude protein uh, content in this plant. So the similar result also obtained in the cacao cell product uh, fermented with Aspergillus niger. You can see from here, the crude fiber before fermentation is 34.5 and, and decreased to become 16.7%. Uh, uh, and also similarly in the crude protein before fermentation is very low, around 11.4% and increased to be 20.2%. Sorry. So in addition, for the lacuna fermented with uh, Aspergillus nigger starter, uh, also decreased the crude fiber content and 
can uh, increase the crude protein uh, content. So to sum up this uh, presentation, uh, one of the application of biotechnology uh, in the processing of the plant-based uh, feed ingredient is the use of micro microbe like uh, fermentation either directly or to the use of enzyme. In general, the application of fermentation and enzyme can improve the nutritional quality of this ingredient. I think that's all my presentation and thank you very much for your attention. Okay, many thanks indeed, Pak Indra Suharman. I think from his presentation, I could draw the short conclusion that the demand on fish feed is increasing yeah, very significantly because of the fish production worldwide. Yeah. And from this uh, reality, we must seek the alternative in the feed production. Yeah. And he proposes that uh, at least if you have the material availability, so use the locally available materials, it is very advisable. Yeah. And then, then the second one is the safety to the environment. So if we use the material, we must uh, consider with the safety to the water column. Yeah? And then the third one, maybe you apply also some uh, enzymes and using to enhance the feed production. So many thanks for this uh, valuable lesson from Pak Indra. Yeah? And it is really something uh, enriching our uh, seminar today. So would you please give the applause to all seven presenters? Okay, uh, before I lead the discussion, I would present one uh, we call Pantun also because this morning Putri and Afran also presented Pantun. Pantun is a traditional uh, rhyme from uh, Rio or Malay culture in general. Yeah. Uh, ini pantun bap kepada bapak ibu terutama yang berasal dari luar uh, Rio ya. Yeah. Uh, pantun dadakan yang saya buat mudah-mudahan berkenan. <tuh> Hangatnya sang surya di pagi hari membawa harapan, jaya dan hidup insani. Di, di ISFM 10 kumpul para peneliti. Semoga bermanfaat bagi pembangunan bahari. Baik. So now we come into the discussion session. I would like to give the keynote speakers to ask to answer the question. So far we have collected five questions from five uh, participants. And the first one is from Pak Edison. Yeah. Uh, he addresses the question to Professor Sotawat Benjakul. Yeah. His question was about the carcigon, carcigon, carcigenic residue that might be resulted from the coconut husk application. So to Professor Sotawat, please answer this question. Uh, so thank you so uh, so much for the question. Actually, you know, basically the uh, uh, coplasma, the principle is to generate the active species which can kill the or the bacteria, particularly spoilage, also pathogenic bacteria. However, from our, our observation, we found that this guy active species is a uh, have the short lifespan. You know, actually, when they interact with the membrane of the bacteria, uh, it's gone. So. But, uh, the question is good because uh, those kind of active species can induce the changes of the uh, muscle, fish muscle, or other uh, products, yeah, right? So, but uh, so far we don't have any report uh, on the carcinogen on the uh, the the uh, product treated with the coplasma. That because of maybe like a short lifespan of the species. So, uh, whenever we use the coplasma that is recommended to use hurdle technology. It means that you use the other thing like additives or other. So we also actually, we conduct experiment with the modified animal fair packaging. So apart from only like a prostate gases I mentioned, we also include the carbon dioxide in, in the, the package that we got in back, you know, that because the carbon dioxide also, they can dissolve to carbonic acid and function at antimicrobial agent as well. So I would say that uh, you know, so far, I don't have any report for the carcinogen, carcinogen 
on the, the treated uh, uh, sample uh, with the coplasma. Yeah. Is this clear? Not sure. Uh, sorry, Professor Sotawat, maybe the moderator or the uh, uh, okay, okay, uh, he already joined again. Okay, oh, he's come back. Go come ahead, back. Pro Dr. Joko. I cannot hear, I cannot hear you. Please unmute, Dr. Joko. You, you, you turn, switch off the microphone. Sorry. Yeah, ah, okay. I'm very sorry because every every day at 11 o'clock, uh, it seems there is a regularity in, in my office that the internet is down a little mm -hmm. bit and then uh, it comes again. Okay, thank you anyway uh, from the... Uh, yeah. I hope Pak Edison already uh, catch the answer and Hopefully, if you have more question, you can contact directly to Professor Sotawat. Yeah, thank you, Professor Sotawat. And then the second one is coming from Professor Irwan Effendi. He asked to Professor Dr. Muhammad Rijal, ke Pak Muhammad Rijal, about the society behavior towards the pandemic. It is a kind of uh, common uh, performance. Yeah, every. Indonesia, the society is not that aware uh, about this uh, pandemic, and Pak Irwan wants to have Pak Muhammad Rijal perception or uh, view on this regard. So please, Pak Muhammad Rijal. Thank you, Dr. Joko, the moderator, and thank you uh, very much, Prof. Irwan Fendi. It is a good question uh, uh, for information. It is very complex in dealing with public on the issue of COVID-19 uh, and waste management. Uh, basically, uh, I would like to suggest uh, to apply those approaches that have been suggested in my presentation just now. Uh, for example, one of the approaches is known as the approach by using social dimension perspective, uh, by increasing the level of awareness of the public, the society, to assault all sorts of mediums. Uh, in the case of manner, God's willing, inshallah, uh, with this kind of approach, the public will be aware uh, the fact that the proper self-actions uh, from each individual uh, is needed in having COVID-19, as well as waste management. Okay, that's about it from me, uh, Dr. Joko. Okay. <clears throat> Terima kasih Pak Muhammad Rijal. I hope Pak Irwan has got the explanation from uh, Professor Muhammad Rijal and in the room of uh, in the chat room I think uh, Pak Professor already mentioned also yeah there. I hope uh, it will uh, add explanation that he just given to us. Okay, and the third question is coming from uh, Ibu Mardalisa. Yeah? Uh, she asked to Ibu Natra yeah, about the application in shrimp pond. So would you please answer Ibu Natra? What is the question? This uh, PS Social Microbiology Communication and this part. Okay, uh, how Natra? can it be applied in shrimp pond? Is that the question? All right, uh, so for the time being, um, there are a number, uh, I noticed that there are a number of companies that are basically uh, using 
probiotic with pharmacy in vitro as their fit product. And there are also options, but this is still under study where we can integrate seaweed with chloramycin in vitro or microalgae um, in a machine pond system um, and use it as a uh, new embedded with the natural uh, ecosystem too. So that is, is, that is a way of application, but then it's still, uh, you know, still under research. So in terms of um, whether it, it works or not, uh, it's uh, still, uh, it's still in, in question. Okay, thank you, Ibu Natra. Yeah, I hope Bu Mardalisa already uh, understood about the answer. Yeah, and answer number four is coming from Ibu Rahmi. Yeah, ini ya. Uh, she delivered the question to Professor Janis Alamoragasa yeah, about the effect of to fish from the isopod infection. Okay. So please, uh, Janis, yeah, so, yeah. answer this question. So isopods do have certain effects on their hosts, their fish hosts. So for one, the survival would get lower because the behavior of the fish, the host fish would actually change in that they would swim maybe slower, uh, their rate of feeding would be lower. So that would, of course, in, in decrease their survival. Moreover, gonads, the sex organs of infected fish, are found to be smaller in size. Therefore, their reproduction and fecund fecundity is also lowered. Moreover, some of these isopods are actually carriers or vectors of other pathogens or other parasites. For example, some isopods are carriers of roundworms. And Sir Joko was correct a while ago in saying that if we don't cook our fish properly, uh, those parasites could survive and that could infect humans. So there is zoonotics happening. And lastly, um, isopods, when they bite into or, or cling into their host, uh, they would produce wounds and openings which would uh, cause secondary infections from bacteria and fungi uh, because there are already already openings and wounds and that would be open to infection, to further infection. Many thanks indeed, Janice. It is very clear, yeah? And I hope this is also important for us when we do the community extensions because as scientists, I think everywhere is similar. We have one uh, function to the community for this activity. Yeah, so please cook properly, because from uh, my own experience, when we go to the community, they finish catch the fish, and then sometimes they do not clean the fish, and they cook it directly. Particularly, and if they 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 are on the beach, and then uh, directly prepare and without cleaning at all sometimes. And even in, in my local now, in, in western part of Sumatra, uh, they do not clean the, the inside organs of the fish. So the intestine is still there. The, yeah, every, everything is still there. Yeah, so it is not uh, recommended, I think. Yeah, that's uh, adding the explanation from Janice. So the last one is from Agus, Agus Kurnia, yeah. Uh, to again to Professor Natra, yeah. Uh, this also written in the chat room, yeah. I think. Uh, okay. Uh, on the mechanism yeah, bacteria yeah. between different species, yes. Um, Bacteria, they indeed have specific signal for that. Uh, one signal that are known to be used for, um, you know, in different species of bacteria are auto inducer two. So most of the bacteria, uh, they have this type of signal molecule. They are able to produce this signal molecule, and different species, uh, can basically recognize this signal molecule. 
Okay, that is for question number one. And how about materials or vectors to ensure and use in micro RK? Uh, so, uh, in terms of mechanism, uh, it's quite unique because uh, bacteria, you know, um, since we know already they are very social, uh, they do release a number of molecules. Uh, some are inhibitory molecules, some are good molecules uh, in terms of communication. So, these molecules are known to be responsible in terms of activity uh, within their species and also within the host that they are residing, uh, such as the series. I hope it answers the question. Okay, thank you, Ibu Natra. Yeah? I hope uh, Pak Agus Kutunia also said explanation. I think there is another one left. Uh, Address it is addressed to Pa Indra, I think, yeah, about water hygiene. If I'm not mistaken, let me check the question. Nah, uh, I think from Pak Agus Kurnia again, yeah, Pak Indra, Pak Agus Kurnia is in Kendari, Leo. Thank you for a great presentation. I have one question. How about the digestibility of the fish when they fed? with leaf water hyacinth fermented. So, Pak Indra, please answer. Uh, thank you, uh, Pak Joko. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Agus Kurnia from uh, Halolio University in Kendari. Yeah? This very nice uh, question about this uh, presentation. So, uh, so, as we know, the, there are so many uh, fermenters that we can use to ferment some several plants uh, fit ingredients like uh, a co uh, rumen liquor uh, asparagus vinegar bacillus and others that have some enzyme that can decrease or lower the crude fiber content in the several uh, plant ingredients so in this case in uh, water hyacinth leaf meal they already fermented by using either from uh, Co Roman liquor or asparagus vinegar that have already conducted this experiment, this they can decrease the uh, crude fiber content and also they can uh, de increase the digestibility of the ingredient. So when the fish uh, fit by this fermented water, here's uh, the it's also can uh, go can grow uh, very well. Uh, compare with uh, using the water hessian leaf meal without the fermentation. So it means uh, fermented water hessian leaf meal can use for the alternative uh, pit ingredient for the uh, some several uh, fish like this. Okay, thank you, Pak Indra, for your uh, explanation. Uh, I think we have but extra. This is addressed to Professor Liu around uh, about the conservation of salt. Yeah. Uh, the person who asked is, I think, Mrs. Yeah, Mrs. R. D. Sibagariang. Yeah, dear professor, how the way to campaign customer to save sharks or to minimize for buying endangered sharks? Thank you, professor. Please, Leo. professor Liu. Oh uh, yes. Uh... Actually, the, the training and uh, training uh, of uh, like a fin identification for customers is one way to prevent uh, the importing of Cytex appendix species. Uh, that's one way. Uh, the other way is to uh, promote uh, public education uh, to to uh, to that the general public to know uh, which species is in uh, endangered species. So. The people can will not uh, buy the products, so I think that's uh, the two way. One is for the uh, customer training to prevent uh, import from the uh, other country. One is for the uh, general public. We will promote uh, uh, public training or public awareness uh, for the people to know. Public awareness, I think. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. All right, many thanks to Professor Liu. I think that's all from the question addressed to the keynote speakers. Once again, as moderator, I would like to cordially 
thanks to all seven great 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 scientists great great researchers yeah on the topics are very intriguing very interesting and i think uh, from this seven topics we need many works in the future yeah because all of them are applicable to our environment in southeast asia taiwan even all over east asia yeah so that is my uh, duty but before i close the session one more rhyme of uh, pantun yeah for you uh, this is about sitting here all together because we want to develop the nation develop the region from the sake of or from the aspect of marines and fisheries yeah marine science and fisheries Okay, uh, izin. I guess. Di malam hari para nelayan membawa udang dan tenggiri. Di ISFM 10 yang ditaja FPK Unri, kita bertaut. Guna berkaya nyata bersama jayakan negeri. Terima kasih. And now I would like to invite from the committee to present the certificate to our honorable keynote speakers. So the first, uh, would you show us again uh, the former certificate, Mas Andre, uh, or Professor Emmanuel M. Veracruz from the Philippines? Yeah. Here is the certificate of appreciation from the committee. Yeah. Many thanks. And then the second one to Professor Liu Kuang Ming from Taiwan. Okay. This is our appreciation. Many thanks. And then the third one is for Professor Dr. Muhammad Rijal from Malaysia. Silakan Bapak. Yeah, this is our appreciation. And then the fourth one to Professor Sotawat Benjakul of Thailand. This is for our many thanks. We're really happy to learn from you, Ibu Natra. Okay, and then the sixth one is for Associate Professor Janis Alanoragaza from the Philippines. Neo University. We are very thankful indeed, Janice. Last but not least, from our colleagues, for our colleagues from Universitas Rio, Dr. Indra Suharman, the many, many thanks, Pak Indra, for your time. You're welcome, Dr.
Kahirobil Alamin, the session of certificate presentation also done. And now I will pass this to MC kepada Ananda Putri dan Afran. So Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat siang and a very good noon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Samiaji and keynote speakers who just finished to lead the plenary session. Before we continue our session, let's capture this moment, even though we only meet by the screen. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh yeah. Uh, to all the participants, please turn on your camera so we can take a screenshot. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna count down. Three, two, one. Again. Okay. Again. Three, two, one. Okay, now we're going to the second slide. Smile, everybody. I'm going to count down. Three, two, one. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen. We are pleased to invite you to the respective room as guided by the organizer. Would you please to check in your email regarding the placement according to the topic? Ikan selais ditangkap di teratak bulu. Ikan motan ditangkap di sungai Kampar. Semoga ISFM ke-10 dapat dilaksanakan dengan lancar. It means we hope that the 10 ISFM can be conducted properly. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Bapak Ibu yang telah hadir yang dari luar Unri ya. Ini ada teman-teman dari Aceh, Sulawesi Tenggara ya. Maluku eh, Maluku, kemudian Sulawesi Utara ya, ada Politeknik Nusa Utara ya, ada Sekolah Tinggi Pertanian juga di mana itu di Kutai Timur ya, saya lihat kemudian teman-teman unit ada Pak Hari Profesor Hari Eko Rianto, ada Bu Husna, lama banget kita tidak jumpa ya Bapak Ibu ya. Terima kasih partisipasinya, ada Politeknik Bengkalis ya. Ada juga dari uh, tetangga Universitas uh, Islam Rio, ada Universitas uh, Andalas juga ada ya. Terima kasih. Terus tentunya juga dari STPK Matauli juga hadir ya. Sebagai anak dari Unri ya. <laughs> ya. Bapak Ibu, terima kasih kami haturkan. Oke, okay. kepada panitia juga ya. Oke. Okay. Uh, saya akan lift izin. Mudah-mudahan kita sehat semua. Thank you, and for those presenters who will be present the research today, we are, going, we are going to use the same Zoom meeting link. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Joko, for arranging this symposium. Terima kasih banyak juga. Alhamdulillah telah berjalan dengan lancar ya. Waktunya juga. Uh, masih tersatri. Halo Bu Husna, tidak ketemu kita lama sekali. Ya. Bu Husna, Masih baik -baik. Masih ada. Bisa matikan, Saya mau ngomong. Bu Husna masih ada ya, Bu Husna? 
Sandra, I, I have to go. Thank you very much. I hope I'll see you. I'll see you in person. Okay, thank you, Janice. See you somewhere, maybe. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Janice. Thank you all the speakers for a nice presentation today. <laughs> okay, thank you also. Thank you, Papa. Yeah, Professor Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks. Bu Usna masih online ya, Pak Joko? Masih. Terima kasih, Pak Rizal. Oh ya. Apa kabar Bu Usna? Bu Usna, Ma. Baik ya, izin lift saya. Terima kasih uh, kepada panitia. Selamat melanjutkan bekerja untuk sesi di siang nanti. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Bu Trisla dan tim.